And that's working well. <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah, never mind. Never mind, my friends. How are we? Welcome back to, well, the Universe of Elite, shall we say. Um, and, uh, well, no more Alpha. The Alpha is gone. Um, we have lost it. It has disappeared from the menu. It has become a not thing. Uh, we are we are complete. <laughs> it's all Alpha-tastic. It's all, it's all ended. Um, but there we go. Um, as always, a smooth start. <laughs> uh, it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. Now, um, um, no, I've, I've actually logged in as me. Um, Commander Commander Drew Wager this evening. Um, <laughs> I have to say, I kind of I logged in and thought, that's not my ship. And then I remembered it is my ship. Uh, it's one of my ships. Um, this is actually my anti Thargoid ship um, that I've been mucking about with um, experimentally, you know, for, for, for science and stuff. Um, but um, we're in a bit of a we're in a bit of a gap now, aren't we? Because it's the sixth of May. Okay, um, it's the day after the day after the, the you know Star Wars Day. <laughs> So, um, what I thought it might be fun to do is a bit of a retrospective on the whole kind of um, elite thing. You know, where, where are we? What, you know, what are we looking forward to? Where, where have we got to with elite um, and stuff? Um, so, um, I have I have on my PC as as some of you know. Oh, my camera's at a funny angle as well. So it's all it's all going it's all going that's better, kind of. I, don't know, I might trim my head off. I don't want that. <laughs> Um, have I taken down? I, I've taken down an interceptor. Yes, I, that's about the. That's about all I've done, um, with with the help of my son, who is much better flying than me. Um, so um, so yeah. So uh, he's he's a bit better now. But so before we get into it, yeah. Before we get into Elite Dangerous, um, because the key thing here is that Elite Dangerous Odyssey is kind of the next thing. It's almost, um, and and I haven't heard anybody else say this actually, but it's almost Elite Dangerous Two. Um, which is sort of how I'm beginning to think of it, because it's, you know, the amount of work um, that has gone into Elite Dangerous Odyssey is very much comparable and possibly even bigger than the amount of work that went into the original Elite Dangerous back in 2012 to 2014. Because uh, we got to the end of the Kickstarter in... I think early 2013, if my memory serves. Um, I have got notes and things like that, but um, <laughs> they're on the other computer. Um, and uh, Revenge of the Sixth. Is it Revenge of the Fifth? I thought it was Revenge of the Fifth. That's the joke, isn't it? Sith and Fifth and May the Fourth. Is that all right? Or is it the Sixth? Or is, is it Fifth and Sixth? Because the, obviously there's always two, and Master and an Apprentice. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe that's the case. But um, so, yeah, so Elite Dangerous. I think I think Elite Dangerous Odyssey can almost be seen as Elite Dangerous 2 because I think an, a, a comparable amount of work has gone in or at least elapsed time has gone into Elite Dangerous Odyssey um, compared to the original Elite Dangerous. Now I think I'm right in saying that the Kickstarter was in 2012, it ran until early 2013. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think November 2012 was the Kickstarter when it started. That that seems right to me. I think it finished in January because it was it a two month Kickstarter. So that means 2013 and the Gamma and the release of Elite Dangerous One came out um, at the end of 2014, if I'm remembering correctly. If, if anybody else who was there, because <laughs> it's a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Um, um, so just trying to put this in context, okay, so there's about two years of development there, full full whack development from Frontier, um, from early 2013 to the end of 2014, so not quite two years, and then Elite Dangerous 1.0 comes out, okay, now I don't know, I don't know precisely when development on Elite Dangerous Odyssey started, um, it seems you know, certainly seems it must have been at least two years. Maybe it's longer than that. So, I, the amount of dev effort, therefore, that went in is going into the, the new version, which comes out in obviously a couple of uh, just under a couple of weeks now, isn't it? Is I think comparable. So, this is kind of to me, it's Elite Dangerous Two. <laughs> um, and I know it's got the same code base, but an awful lot of the code base I think may have been changed because we've seen, you know, enhanced graphics. We've seen. Um, We've seen things like the SRV um, and the um, 
yeah, the, the ship launch fighter has been rationalised a bit, perhaps, in some of their capabilities. So things like that lead me to think that there's been quite a lot of uh, work underneath. So I don't know I don't know what you guys think, but that's kind of how I'm beginning to think of it. Um, I know it's not called Elite Dangerous 2, it's called Elite Dangerous Odyssey, but it's, it's big enough to be, um, you know, a, a significant thing. Now, a bit, a bit of context, OK? A bit of context for you. Now, you know, those of you who are new to my streams will be thinking, why isn't he playing the game? Why is he waffling on? <laughs> Little do you know. <laughs> because I like to waffle and I, I, I waffle on Thursdays about Elite and stuff. Okay, now this is obviously Elite Dangerous um, on my screen at the moment, but back in the dim and distant days, okay, for those of you who haven't seen this, uh, and I'm sure most of you will because a lot of you were, have followed me for quite some time, but um, let me just let me just capture my chat box and um, game uh, my, my camera here because I think I need to put them back onto this window over here. Um, let me just see if I can get that to work. Hang on a minute. I've disappeared for a moment, but I'm still here. And so are you. There we are. I'm back. And so are you, hopefully. <laughs> because what I want to do is I want to swap over to this. Will it work? Come on. Yay. There it is. Look at that. <laughs> okay, so this, for those of you who don't know what this is, this is the original Elite. Okay, this is 1984. So I can wake you back into the ancient mists of time okay um so a bit retro so i'm not going to concentrate too much on this but what i wanted to show you okay is just what is the essence of the previous games all right what is the essence of the previous game um so i'm not going to load a new commander because i don't have one saved so um press space commander okay um so this is this is how the original game started out lave okay so you you remember um some of these systems still exist in Elite dangerous lave diso listy uh tian isla Dear old Tian Isla, okay. Um, and you start off, as you saw, in a Cobra Mark III. So that's the iconic spaceship. That's what this game provided. Um, there was a massive galaxy of stuff to go and explore. It was all fairly similar. I mean, you've got to bear in mind that this game is 32 kilobytes in, in entire size, okay? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's it yeah, and yeah that's that's all you've got to play with um, but every every planet had a, had a description um, and there was a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek description for all the planets here Lave is most famous for its vast rainforest and for the Lavian tree warthog because <laughs> um, there were human colonials but you'll notice on some of the planets if I can remember how to to navigate things which I can't um, Oh, hang on. I remember how to do this. Every so often the game seizes up. Let me just reload that. There we go. I'm not quite sure what caused that. There we go. Right, it's working again. Now, if I go to, if I go to Listy, then that's human colonials as well. If I go to Dizo, um, the, the entire planet there is populated by black, <laughs> black fairy felines. So in this universe, okay, uh, the original Elite, the universe is populated by sentient creatures of some strange type, okay? Um, and uh, there's various different types. I think Ridquat uh, is harmless rodents. Um, and uh, Arov, what have we got in Arov? Um, human colonials there. Uh, we have Riot, which has uh, black fat felines, okay? So... All sorts of things, and there are lobsters, and there's you know, there's all sorts of things. Obviously, out there as well as the the, the thugwood. Now, it is very hitchhiker esque There's a lot of hitchhikery humour in um, elite in the original Elite. Okay. Um, now, other stuff that you'll be familiar with is you know buying and selling stuff. So I can buy some stuff. I can buy 17 tons of food, and I can buy some textiles, and then that's all my Cobra is capable of holding at the moment. Um, I think I'm right in saying, there you go. So there's my inventory, it tells me what I've got in my ship. I've got uh, 28 credits, 28.8 <laughs> credits. I've got a cargo of food and textiles. I've got some fuel, I can go somewhere. So um, what you probably would do early on is go to somewhere safe, like Leasty. Um, I can also um, sell things, but I don't want to do that right now. Um, I can also equip my ship, okay? So I start off with a rubbish spaceship and I have to buy missiles and cargo bays and ECMs and extra beam lasers and all sorts of good stuff, okay? Um, uh, fuel scoops and escape pods and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and the edible poets, don't forget the edible poets. No, there are some edible poets. Um, 
So um, there's lots of stuff in there. Now, there's a lot of lore background to this game, which is embedded in the game manual, which came with the original game, and a book that came with the original game as well, called The Dark Wheel. And many of you all have heard about The Dark Wheel, of course. Um, but the premise here is that you don't have much money to start with. You have to go out and trade and fight and shoot and survive to get lots of money to upgrade your ship so you can just keep doing the same things over and over again. And eventually you end up with a ship that can kind of do everything. Uh, which has decent shields and decent weapons and missiles and extra cargo bays and all sorts of stuff. You know, there, there's no engineers or anything like that in, <laughs> in the original Elite. Um, you can't land on the planets um, because the planets really literally are just a black circle. Um, in fact, I can show you that by launching. There we go. We are now leaving the space station. Um, and here is, there is the planet. <laughs> in all its 8-bit glory and um, yeah but various things about the HUD you will notice are familiar so um, on this version of Elite we have a front and rear shield that's what FS and AS stands for uh, front shield aft shield we have fuel level it's totally full uh, we have cabin temperature we get too close to a star we start to heat up laser temperature we can overheat our guns um, an altitude meter above the planet whichever gets too low we blow up uh, the number of missiles on board you can see three slots are full um, we've got the speed indicator, which, uh, you know, uh, if I can remember the keys, uh, there we go, goes up and down, <laughs> fair enough. Um, we've got a roll and dive climb indicator, and then we've got, three, uh, got four energy banks, okay, one, two, three, four. Um, the HUD is probably fairly familiar as well, so you can see on the HUD, um, you know, the, the, the locations of the ships. There's also a radar. Um, and uh, we've also got a kind of compass there on the top right of that, that kind of area, which, again, you'll notice has carried across to Elite Dangerous. It's still there. Um, if we turn around, here is um, a very familiar site. Um, if, you can, if you can cope with the frame rate. For those of you who have only been <laughs> playing games in the last 10 years, you might be thinking, that's not a frame rate. That's a slideshow. But this, this is how games were played back in the day, OK? Um, and uh, yeah, a spinning space station uh, of, of a certain type. Okay, so this is Coriolis space station. Okay, this is where it all comes from, all right? Um, uh, what's the big five or S in the bottom right corner? Right, the big five or big S is basically we're in a safe zone. Okay, so the S is for safe. Uh, we are in station space, okay? we're close to the station. So it, basically it's a no fire zone, as in Elite Dangerous, okay? Uh, if we fire on anybody when the S is up, the police will come and attack us. And in this era of Elite, um, the space station didn't open fire on you. If I open fire on the space station, the police come out and kill me. Okay, so I'll, I'll fire my weapons. Um, I've just realised I haven't got the sound on. Hang on a moment. Because um, the sound effects are, of course, legendary. All right, right so <laughs> in come the police, okay? Um, and they're, they're, they're flying vipers. Um, I can't destroy the space station, obviously, with this poultry little gun, but um, you can try. And the police will come out and eventually they'll get their act together and they will kill me. Okay, so that's how this kind of game. Here we go, look, someone's actually firing at me. Um, <laughs> um, now, this game gave you the basics, okay? So Elite, Elite was revolutionary at the time, 1984, okay? You have to, maybe I should fire some missiles. Let's fire some missiles, there we go. Why not? <laughs> Space Station has an ECM, that's what the ECM is, that's what the E is, okay? Um, and um, so a lot of the constructs that were um, around for the, uh, the Elite Dangerous that you're familiar with came from here. The Space Stations are from the original game, okay? The concept of um, piracy and anarchy and, and you know police enforcement, all that sort of stuff come from here. The idea of a no-fire zone comes from here. Um, the idea of the Cobra Mark III and many of the original ships comes from here. Um, the scanner is virtually unchanged. It comes from here. The compass comes from here. Um, all of these things are um, things that are kind of run through the franchise. Okay, so that's that's the sort of thing. Um, now in this game, there are um, you know it's it's obviously fairly limited. It's a 32k game, kilobytes. Okay, 32,000 bytes. That's it. That's all you got, and that's for a graphics, gameplay, sound effects, everything. All right. I'm about to die, as you can see. Um, <laughs> let's just get far at the space station, because why not? <laughs> um, you call the guy the Celestial Warrior once, and then that's it. So um, they're not doing a very good job of killing me. They should have got me by now, but um, they will get me in a moment, OK? So a lot of that stuff begins here, and the law begins here, OK? The bit that I care about the most, the law begins here. So the Dark Wheel, Raxler. Um, all the old world's content and all that sort of stuff starts with this game. It's what came along with this game. So this game contributed the foundations for the entire Elite experience. Okay, we're just about to die, so here we go. 
come on, kill us off. Energy low. We've got flashing red warning lights. The police are now toying with me. <laughs> Try to wait to kill me. They'll get me in a moment. Or you could just ram the space station. Let's do that. Um, boom. Game, game over. How 80s is that? <laughs> and then we get back to the uh, the spinning cobra on the front of you. Now, the game's pretty limited, okay? You have a ship. You can't have any other ships. You can only have the one ship. Um, there's no concept of buying or selling ships yet. Um, but uh, what, you know, you know, and you can upgrade your ship to a degree, okay? You can put better guns on it, more missiles, better shields, etc., 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 and do more stuff. There are some baked in missions for this game. So, um, on the Spectrum version, which is the one that I'm showing here that I'm most familiar with, there were missions like rescuing people from a supernova, um, a Thargoid invasion where you had to fight loads and loads of Thargoid ships. Um, you had to smuggle some plans. Pirates could uh, creep aboard your ship and just end your game without any gameplay things like that there were there were a bunch of coded missions in the game which kind of gave you things um that encourage you to explore further and you could go off and you know try and find various things now there isn't much variety in this game because it's just too small but um it is an amazing point in time okay um and you have to put this in context of 1984 but there's a lot of lore a lot of background a lot of stylistic stuff that has its has its origins in this original game so it's a very important thing all right it's a very important thing um, and i'm hugely fond of it as you can probably tell um yeah if you want to go and see the missions that are in these uh, in the spectrum version in particular um i did a youtube series on my retro channel so if you can go and look that up you obviously youtube.com forward slash drew wager nice and easy to find uh, you can go and look that sort of stuff up and go and go and have a play some of them are quite cool some of them <laughs> <laughs> quite amusing um there's um there's one where you get to get a cloaking device which allows you to hide from other ships which is which is quite fun as well so there's all sorts of neat little touches in in, in those versions but that's that's 1984 okay so that's the first game so let, let's move on what's next okay so um we also have and that also just skipped straight across to frontier which is sitting in the background the we also have this okay so now time moves on a little bit my friend like time moves on a little bit okay so this this wonderful day glow construction here is the second elite. So the first elite comes out in 1984. All right, this first elite comes out in 1984. Then there is a gap of nine years. Okay, nine years until we get Frontier Elite 2, which is what you're seeing on the screen now. Now this is firmly in the 16 bit era, okay? Um, now, a lot of stuff has changed, but a lot of stuff has stayed the same. Okay, the scanner is instantly recognizable. It's very elite -y. OK, um, we don't have a Cobra anymore, although we do have the option to start with one. OK, so let me just show you that, because um, when you when you start this game, you get a, you get a very funky intro, as, as most of you already know. We've, we've talked about this length and we have again, I've done the playthrough of this game. Um, but if we start in the Lave system, we start at Lave Orbital Space Station, which is exactly where we were in the original game. And uh, we start in, you'll be surprised to know, uh, where is it? There, in a Cobra Mark III. So you always get that iconic start point, okay? There's the Cobra Mark III. I mean, look at the, the graphics have uh, um, improved dramatically over the 8 bit. They're now filled polygons. <laughs> it's, things have really moved on. Um, there's a bit more sophistication now because we have um, ships with different hyperdrives. We can buy and sell ships. We don't have to stick with this one. We can actually go to the shipyard um, and look at the amazing photo for imagery. We can we can we can buy a ship. Okay, we can actually trade our Cobra Mark III and buy a different ship. So there's adders and there's crates and geckos and vipers and all sorts of and mores and pythons. Those ship names, okay, the pythons, the adders, all the ones that begin with snakes, basically, all have their origins back in these games. Okay, that's where they come from. Um, so if I would, uh, if I was looking at a crate, I could go actually. Well, there we go. I'll, well, maybe I'll buy a crate. Look at that crate. It looks like an absolute crate, but there it is. Um, um, and um, you know, we can buy all sorts of interesting equipment for our ship. Uh, we have, um, now where's the shipyard? Let's go upgrade. So, you know, there's lots of stuff to buy. We can buy atmospheric shielding because of course on this game, we can land on the planet surfaces and not just airless moons or thin atmospheres. We can land anywhere we like in this game. Something that, um, because of the graphical fidelity that we demand in computer games these days, um, this game actually has a wider scope believe it or not, than Elite Dangerous can offer at the moment, simply because um, 
in the 16-bit era, the graphical fidelity just can't be as high, so you can big it, make it, make it, make it bigger. So we can land on any planet we like in Frontier Elite 2. Um, there's not a great deal down there, of course, other than a few polygons, but hey, <laughs> it can still be done. Um, there's automatic pilots, which are very, very dangerous indeed. Um, we can fuel scoop, we can buy different types of missiles, we can, we can upgrade our ship with different hyperdrives and different lasers and all sorts of stuff. Um, and in this game, the missions are available sort of straight away. We can, we can start doing, um, um, you know, transport missions. We can, we can take people places, and they pay us for doing things. Um, we can um, goods bought and sold. So Edwards Goods Emporium is almost certainly a black market. Okay. Now this is actually rather clever. Unlike Elite Dangerous, the black market isn't a button called black market. It's hidden behind plausible or slightly dodgy sounding things. <laughs> Which is actually, I think, slightly better. Um, people are, you know, you know, there's a donation mission. It isn't just donate to the cause. It's, you know, um, stop the carnage on the newly settled world. There's a little bit more law actually woven into the mission structure uh, on some of these games. Um, and then here's an assassination mission. Okay, it's not just go and assassinate so and so. It's uh, someone for a removal job. Mr. Gonzalez of Sirius Corp needs removing <laughs> from the DSO system. We'll pay you 8,500 8, credits. Um, <laughs> so, a, a sense of humour, okay? Now, here's goods bought and sold. Honest John Peterson, do, does he sound like it? Does he sound right, okay? Um, and, and so on and so forth. So, lots and lots of stuff to kind of do in there. But the same sort of flavours, okay? So, carry some people here, assassinate somebody over there, um, you know, smuggle this to that place, and then so on and so forth. Very, very similar um, sort of stuff. A um, bit more sophistication on the ships, uh, as you can see, but we can buy and sell various different things. Um, now, the, the one big difference um, that this game made is it totally rewrote the law, okay? It totally rewrote the law. So in the original game, you remember, um, there were aliens and um, furry felines and all sorts of things. Boom, they've all gone. They've all gone, disappeared. <laughs> um, so in this game, there are only humans. Um, and, and maybe, maybe some Thargoids, who knows? Uh, but there are only humans. All those marvelous creatures just, they, 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 were, they were wiped out by some uh, cataclysm called a retro, retrospective continuity or retcon. Uh, they, they have gone. And Elite Frontier, Frontier Elite 2 was set in a semi realistic um, universe, um, which is, as you can see, Lave, Deso, and these planets are very, very similar to exactly how they were in the original game. However, Suddenly, um, we are able to, if we, if I, actually that's minus three, minus six. If we go uh, this way, I think it is, um, is it up? There we go. We can see there's the imperial systems. It introduces the concept of the empire. And it, there's Akanar, for example. And it also introduces the concept of the core systems uh, and Sol and the Federation. Suddenly there is law about the Federation and the empire. Um, in, 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 in the universe of Elite Dangerous. And you'll notice here for the first time is a date. This second game, uh, Frontier Elite 2, is set in the year 3200. Okay, and the game starts on the 1st of January. All right. So, um, so you know, that's introduced a realistic galaxy. We can actually kind of see a realistic galaxy um, in, in all its 16 bit glory. And I can, if I zoom out, you know, we can see that we're in this location here currently. Um, and we can see Sol, we can see the Pleiades, Polaris, the Dumbbell, Nebula, Betelgeuse, Rigel, and some of these places you can actually go and visit in this game. Okay, so that's that's actually pretty cool. Uh, and it gives you a sort of flavor of, you know, a real galaxy. Now, um, the vast majority of it is, of course, procedurally generated. Um, and there is a limited, as you can see, amount of 3D here. Um, the galaxy does go up and down a little bit, not very much. It's mostly compressed and flattened. Um, for you know, due to limitations of what they what the computers could cope with, but there is a, there's an, a, there's an element of now a 3D represented galaxy out there for us to kind of try and navigate our way around and and do. So there's that element of exploration, and there is uh, the ability to go mining and various other bits and pieces like that. So um, a lot of very cool stuff. This stuff you'll notice is probably fairly familiar. Look, look, a sort of system map. Does that does that feel familiar? <laughs> there aren't any fleet carriers, so maybe it doesn't. But you know, the idea of having you know, here's your system, and this is this is the, you know, this is the space station, and this is the planet. Yeah, it tells you stuff. Okay, 
Does that does that feel at all familiar? We can find information about what is useful coming in and out of those uh, of those things, um, and we also have um, we have an orrery which is um, which is quite useful. Uh, there isn't a great deal in this system. Um, Planet Lave and Lave, in fact, is all that exists here. Now, interesting enough, in Elite Dangerous, a few extra planets have been added to the Lave system, which is a bit, where did they come from? <laughs> but, you know, the lore does get modified between all the various different games. Um, um, and if we go into space, oops, wrong button. I need to, I need to request launch permission. Uh, there we go. Look at that. An airlock comes down. Uh, we spin around, the airlock opens again. Um, we go into a, some sort of docking bay and then boom there's space now for some strange reason in this game space has turned blue um, there is no good explanation for why space is blue in this game it's just one of those things um, there are a few little graphical fun and games uh, for some reason the Lave space station has got little spinny arms um, again we don't know why that would be uh, but it's been upgraded and here is here's the Cobra Mark 3 uh, with some slightly um, oversized uh, and undercarriage wheels on it, because. Um, but it is the fun thing here is it's is it's, it's also articulated, so you can see the, the game has got a bit more sophisticated over time. There it goes. Look at that! And it all folds away, and you've got spinny things on the bottom of the ship, and you can see the missiles um, on the bottom of the ship, and, and 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 good stuff. And then there's the there's the top. Interesting enough, there's no cockpit on these ships. Um, in the law, the original law of elite, um, none of the ships had glass cockpits. Uh, they only had vision screens, which, if you think about it, makes more sense. But um, that's that's the way it was done in um, in these old games. Still got the same kind of engine thrusters. So if I switch them on, look at that! It thrusts away in a very familiar sort of way um, away from the space station. So you know that that stuff all works the same. Okay. So this game has introduced a full size galaxy. This game has introduced lots and lots of variety of different types of missions, and this game has introduced um, um, you know, some new lore about the Empire and the Federation and all that kind of good stuff. So a lot of, a lot of lore content has come in from there. Um, and, um, but in many ways, the combat in this game um, wasn't as good as the original. Um, now that's a bit of a controversial statement, but I tend to stand by it. The the old game had um, airplanes in space. Okay, you know, a bit like Star Wars, your your spaceship would bank around and fly around like a like an airplane, of course, which is totally unrealistic. But you know, it kind of works for fun. This game tried to go full Newtonian mechanics and did a very good job of it, but it did tend to make the space combat rather. Um, turrety in space, you just sort of spun around and fired at things. And once you had a decent enough gun, you basically could just one shot all the NPCs. Um, and it's important to point out all these previous games are single player only, okay? Single player only. So there's no multiplayer contact in this at all. I mean, it's just pre internet, okay, pretty much. Um, you know, you had dial up modems by this point, and um, you know, null modem cables which you could use to connect two PCs together or IPX, SPX networks, and things like that. But it was it was very, very early days for that kind of technology. Okay, so this is set in a in, in a in a kind of semi Newtonian, you know, realistic physics kind of way. Um, and so, you know, there's if, if I switch the engines off, um, I can actually rotate the ship round um, and there we go. I'm now pointing back at the space station, but I'm now flying backwards. Okay, um, I'm not flying backwards. I've, all I've done is I've just rotated the ship off. So it's it's pretty realistic in that sense. But as you can see, um, it, it can it can be quite hard to master. But a lot of realism. Okay, a lot of realism. There's the, there's the planet. You know, it's actually sort of ray traced where the sun's coming from. Um, so there's nods to realism there. But it's 16 bit. Back in 1991, of course. And if we go up there. Um, there's the star. So the star is casting light rays, if you like, um, in, into the right direction, as you can see by the um, by the planet down there. Uh, and we can land on that planet, and that's a full-size planet. Okay, so it's not like a pretend small world. It's actually realistically sized. Uh, so that's pretty impressive back in 1993. Okay, so that's it's pretty good stuff. So that's that's the second elite. That's the second elite. And then we need to fast forward two more years. Okay, so let's let's get rid of that one. And then we jump into the third, the third elite. Um, now this one, to be honest, didn't do very well. Um, and there's reasons for that. 
Um, uh, part of it is the really, really dreadful music. No, I, no, I, <laughs> I kid you on that one. Um, but um, I'll try and get rid of that straight away. <laughs> Shut up! Music off. There we go. <laughs> Uh, returns again. So this is this is the third game. We've now fast forwarded two more years. Okay, so this is 1995. We've moved on. Um, the game has changed a bit. Now, a lot of this is the same. Okay, look at the uh, the map. Uh, the first thing this game has introduced is the alliance. Okay, so the alliance. Okay, um, is the new political structure. And notice the date um, here is now the 1st of January 3250. So the 50 years has gone by in game time from the previous game that we were just looking at. Okay, um, so this is the year 3250. Now, as you probably know, Elite Dangerous started in the year 3300, another 50 years on from there. But the Alliance has been introduced. Um, the um, Federation is still there. And down here, you'll notice that the Empire is still here with Akinar and so on and so forth. Um, do the wormholes work? Yes, they do. Uh, you can switch them off. There is a there is a bug in the system due to the way that 16-bit computers handle maps. If you did a light, if you did a jump, if 6,535.5 light years, um, the computer went into a effectively <laughs> sort of buffer overload situation and allowed you to make the jump with only the fuel that you had on board the ship, which meant you could jump enormous distances if you knew how the bug worked. <laughs> so there's little exploits you can still do. That bug was never fixed. Um, lots of the other stuff is exactly the same. Okay, so the orrery is now the same. But there's a sort of, as you can see, a very low res. But there's there's a there's background. Your ship has an interior of some kind now, which is which is quite cool. The galaxy map is still there. The system map is is still pretty much the same. Um, there we go. Um, and it's, you know, it tells us things about the system that we're in. This game um, was billed as a sequel. It isn't really a sequel. It's a sort of kind of kind of expansion, really, to, to, the, to the previous game. Uh, but uh, And there's all sorts of, yeah, and we can go to the history of that on another stream, but um, as I've done on YouTube, as you go and have a look through some of my stuff, uh, because there are a few, shall we say, legal wranglings over the, over this, uh, which we won't go into now. Um, but the, the vast majority of this game is the same, okay? The vast majority of this game is the same. What this game had, though, um, which none of the previous elites up until this point had, this game had a story. Okay, and this is where most of the story of Elite Dangerous, the entire thing, comes from this game. This game is 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 the, is, is very different actually to everything else in the Elite universe. Um, because this game told you a story. Now it is obviously still single player, but it told you a story of which you, the player, were were quite often the star. Not always in a good way either. You could be quite notoriously bad. Um, and in this, in, this, in this universe, there were five newspapers that told exploits of what was happening, okay, in the elite, danger, in, in the elite frontier universe, as this was at the time. Um, there's the Imperial Herald, which will take an Imperial slant over everything. So, of course, everything the Federation does is boo, boo, hiss, boo, boo, bad, bad Federation, awful, uh, nasty corporate lackeys, la, 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 la. Um, the Federal Times, not surprisingly, takes the opposite view. Okay, um, Imperials bad, Federation good, <laughs> scum Imperials, um, posh up there, you know, <laughs> all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, these two basically will say pretty much the opposite um, take on any event that happens in the game. Uh, random intergalactic gossip is basically, <laughs> I don't know how these newspapers translate to other countries, but um, random intergalactic gossip is basically um, the Daily Mail. <laughs> the Daily Express for the elite universe. <laughs> um, Frontier News is actually generally quite a good one. It's kind of sensible. And Universal Scientist is the scientific one, which gives you revelations about interesting stuff. And straight away, um, almost straight away, in the uh, Universal Scientist newspaper, you start to learn about the Thargoids. And all the law about, you remember um, INRA? And you remember the Thargoids, and you remember the mycoid virus, etc., etc., etc. All of that stuff starts in this game. Okay, starts in this game. That's where it all comes from. Um, so this game now, an awful lot of people say, "No, Elite of Dangerous is all about blazing your own trail, and you know the galaxy doesn't care about you, and you're just a small spaceship commander." Uh, and people cite that as being the elite thing. Okay, and it's not. It's not. That's not true. Because in this game, Elite Three. 
where all of the main story of Elite Dangerous comes from, you know, um, the terrorism, the Thargoids, the Mycoid virus, Inra, all of that good stuff. Um, you are the star of this game, okay? Not always in a good way, but you are the guy they're talking about. I've been playing this on my Twitch stream on Saturdays for a while, and every so often the uh, <laughs> I've been hunted across the universe, um, and it cites me in the newspaper, the blackguard Commander Wager needs to be destroyed, there's a massive bounty on him. And the newspapers report on your antics. So it is not true to say that in the Elite Dangerous universe, or the Elite universe in general, that you as the player cannot be the star of the show. You can, because this game showed you the way. Um, so there is a massive, massive story in this game, um, which, is, which is actually pretty cool. The only problem with this game really is that it is absolutely riddled with bugs and is virtually unplayable. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, when it came out, it crashed and burned really badly. Okay, it crashed and burned really badly. Whereas the original game sold millions of copies, and the second one, Frontier Elite 2, sold over a million copies, this one crashed and burned. Okay, this one really crashed and burned. Um, and it kind of heralded an era where space games themselves began to sort of disappear. Um, um, kind of, you know, replaced by first-person shooters and so on and so forth. Um, but this game gave you a story. This game gave you a purpose. This gave you a reason for upgrading your ship because stuff would happen and you need to be somewhere and you need to do something. And ultimately, you ended up being the guy who defeated the Thargoids the first time round. So you know that whole Jameson, yeah, Jameson crash site and all that sort of stuff? Well, in this game, you were involved in that whole story. So there's a lot of stuff in here which is very, very cool. Um, and you can still upgrade your ship and do all the normal elite stuff. Okay, so that's the end of 1993. Now at this point, boom, elite disappears. Okay, elite disappears. Elite disappears. It's just gone. Okay, um, and from 1995 to 2012, there was no official elite at all. It's just there just isn't. Okay. There's nothing. Um, and in that time, for an awful lot of people, Elite just disappeared off the radar, okay? Just gone. Um, and, um, you know, there, there is no official Elite. David Braben is now working for Frontier Development. Frontier Developments was actually the first, that, that game that we just saw, Frontier First Encounters, was the first game that Frontier Developments ever released. And it was a disaster. <laughs> it wasn't a very auspicious start, okay? <laughs> but they, they got better. <laughs> and they published a load of other games in the interim, um, but nothing with Elite, uh, nothing to do with Elite. And in those intervening years, from 95 to 2012, which is a long old time, okay, so 95 to 2012 is what? Um, how many years is that? Um, you know, that's 17 years. That's virtually an entire, <laughs> almost a generation has gone by between, you know, 1995, the, the third Elite game, uh, Frontier First Encounters and Elite Dangerous coming out in 20, uh, 2014. It actually came out, so that's sort of 19 years, um, and it was obviously announced in 2012. Um, so that's a big, big gap, and in that gap, there was nothing official. Okay, so the fans, um, you know, the fans of those first three games in different guises, did uh, did off their own back rewrite. Um, elites for modern platforms because of course those platforms were pretty ancient back then. This is pre-3D graphics part cards, pre-decent sound cards, um, pre, I mean you're talking Pentium level processors here, the early, the original series of Pentium processors. I mean, it's, it's absolutely historic stuff by modern standards. Some of the um, fan efforts were to, to remake those games exactly so they would just run on modern hardware. Uh, some of the emulations you saw me running there were exactly that, those kind of outcomes. Other people worked on improving the graphics and some people rewrote the games so that they could kind of just enjoy them um, better. So there were some very, very good fan made creations that existed, particularly in the early noughties. Um, which um, kept the whole elite thing alive, really, in the intervening times. Now, um, Frontier did nothing at all that they, they had to show anyway uh, between 95 and 2012. There was nothing in those 17 years. There were occasionally David Braben would show up at a trade show and say, yes, one day elite will happen. And everyone was kind of like, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And the, and the Elite Four, as it was called in those days, was was this you know was another was another phrase for vaporware. Okay, oh Elite Four, <laughs> that's how good is it? You know, so all of that sort of stuff um, was going on, and the fans carried the torch for this game. Um, so um, 
the fact that there was a market still in some ways for Elite Dangerous when it did eventually turn up, thanks to all the fans of those original three games who kind of kept the whole thing going um, in those intervening years, those long, long intervening, I mean, 17 years between game game releases. It was that, that was a long old time. And then suddenly, boom, Elite Dangerous is, is, is here. And then Elite Dangerous itself. Um, so, so what is Elite? <laughs> What is Elite Dangerous by comparison? What have we got? So let's let's have a look. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna log in here. Um, uh, I can see quite a few of a few of you guys. I've got a few friend requests to accept first. Let me do that. Now the, the first big 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 difference that we got from Elite Dangerous in the Kickstarter was um, it's going to be multiplayer. Okay, it's going to be multiplayer. So that was a big thing. Um, did I pledge to the Kickstarter? Yes, I did. Um, I pledged in a big way, actually. Um, I, <laughs> my, my, actually, to be fair, my original Kickstarter pledge was forty pounds, because I pledged for I think a something digital something pack, and um, I wanted to have an NPC name in the game, and I think that was a forty pound pledge limit. Um, but my my Elite Dangerous story got very complicated very quickly because um, shortly after it launched. I sent a message into Frontier um, because I reverse engineered David Braben's email address, as you do, <laughs> and said, look, yeah, the original game came with a book. Um, yeah, The Dark Wheel, how very exciting it was too. And I said, is, yeah, is there any chance to audition for a, um, a, you know, to write a novel for the new game? Yeah, because Elite Dangerous, you know, why, why doesn't that come with a story as well? Why not, eh? Um, um, I've never come across an NPC Drew Wager. No, the, the NPC Drew Wager, yeah, that's not the NPC I put in. The NPC I put in was um, uh, Rebecca Weston. So if you've ever come across Rebecca Weston in game, that was that was my NPC contribution. OK, you may I've, I've encountered her once, so she is out there. <laughs> and for those of you who want to know who Rebecca Weston is, you're going to have to you have to, have to read my books. I'm sorry, there's no there's no way I can summarise that um, in, in in a few moments in, in the stream. Um, so, but no, I sent an email to David Bremen saying, "Hey, look, why 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 isn't there a book? We should yeah, there should be a book. Could I have a chance? Could I audition to write a book for you uh, for Elite Dangerous?" Um, so I sent that email in, all excited, thinking, "Oh, David Bremen will write back um, and go, yes, Drew, that's awesome." <laughs> of course, they didn't. <laughs> uh, I never got I never got an answer okay I never got an answer um, and um, oddly enough though and I don't know if this is a coincidence I never found out whether this was a coincidence or not but the next day or, or just a few days after I'd sent that email in suddenly on the Elite Dangerous Kickstarter there was a new pledge level for four and a half thousand pounds which was write your own book in the Elite Dangerous universe <laughs> so I was like <gasps> And I was like, yay! And then, then I looked at the four and a half thousand pounds and went, no! <laughs> it's like, oddly enough, um, you may be surprised to know this, but I didn't have four and a half grand just sort of lying about. <laughs> I go, yeah, I'm going to stick that on an internet website. <laughs> um, so whether David Braben was a bit, um, a bit a bit miffed that I'd reverse engineered his email address, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, maybe he thought, ah, this is a good wheeze. <laughs> We can make some money out of this. Um, anyway, so there was a pledgeable. There were 10 pledges available for you to write your own book. Um, now, I didn't have four and a half grand. So what I did um, rather sneakily was I write, <laughs> I started my own Kickstarter, OK, with, with the only intention of raising four and a half grand so I could put the proceeds of my Kickstarter onto the Elite Dangerous Kickstarter, which I have to admit was pretty darn cheeky. but. Um, and I think it's now banned. I don't think you're allowed to do it anymore. But at the time, I checked with um, Kickstarter themselves and they said it wasn't a problem. I sent an email to David Braben saying, this is what I'm planning to do because I'd really like to write a book, but I haven't got four and a half grand. I'm going to try and raise it, OK, <laughs> by doing another Kickstarter. Um, and uh, I got, I believe it, at that point, I got an email back. This is the first time I'd ever spoken to David Braben. He went, uh, yes, that's fine, Drew, and good luck. So I was like, yay! So I pressed the button on my Kickstarter and literally then all hell broke loose, right? <laughs> because <laughs> a loads of, well, quite to be off, to be to be fair, lots of people on the Elite Dangerous Kickstarter went, yay, Drew Wager, we know who he is. He's the guy who wrote those fan fiction books for Olite. Um, and yeah, he's he's a good egg. You know, you can trust Drew. He's, he's, 
He's not a pirate. Yeah, he's not just trying to pinch the money. Um, but there were an awful lot of people on the Elite Dangerous <laughs> Kickstarter who basically said, who is this guy? What's he doing? He's a complete nutter. He's trying to derail the Elite Dangerous Kickstarter. He's trying to steal money off people. <laughs> And that was, that was, I was sort of juggling that for the first couple of days. And then the press, the, the gaming press, so the likes of uh, PC Gamer and Polygon and you know, a whole bunch of others basically got hold of this, the fact that I was kickstarting a Kickstarter. Um, and then just went to town on it with a kind of guy launches Kickstarter to fund Kickstarter. <laughs> Where does this ever stop? Um, and then lots of other people started chiming in with, can I kickstart a pledge on Drew's Kickstarter so that his Kickstarter will then fund the other Kickstarter? And how, <laughs> how far around can we make this go? And it all got a bit mad. But the upshot of it all was, okay, nine days into my Kickstarter, I hit my target. People people trusted me enough. That they gave me four and a half grand um, to um, to pitch onto the Elite Dangerous Kickstarter, okay? So I pitched, I did, one, the moment I had the money, I pitched it onto the Elite Dangerous Kickstarter, and it just so happened to be the the point at which Elite Dangerous's Kickstarter went over the halfway mark. So yours truly here, Drew Wager, um, pushed the Elite Dangerous Kickstarter over the halfway mark. So that's, the, that's my main claim to fame on the Elite Dangerous Kickstarter, okay? Um, so yeah, so was that was that my first battle with forum fighters? Yes, so I, I had to do an awful lot of convincing that basically I wasn't a crook. <laughs> and I was at pains to stress that I'd asked Frontier to say, is it okay? And I'd asked Kickstarter, is it okay? And I asked a few of my friends who basically said, I can't see, I mean, it sounds completely mad, but I don't see why it wouldn't work, or at least it's worth a try, go for it. And so I did, I don't, you know, and then at the end of it, both my Kickstarter and the Elite Dangerous one were successful and you know, <laughs> the rest is history. Elite Dangerous came out and I got to write a book, which was awesome. Um, so yeah, so now we're now 51 minutes into the stream and I'm about to start the game. <laughs> so yes, so that was that was my experience of those early games. I mean, it, it was it was huge fun. It was kind of all a bit chaotic and yeah, there wasn't a game that existed. And I had to write a book before the game even came out. So those of you who've read Elite Reclamation, which is a book I wrote back then, We'll note a few things about the book that don't quite gel with the game, and that's because there wasn't a game. <laughs> All I had when I was writing the book was a bunch of guides and a few kind of scrappy screenshots and concept art. That's basically all I had. Um, <laughs> so it was quite hard to write a book that was accurate to the game before the game actually existed. So, um, and literally just as I was in the final stages of editing, the alpha of Elite Dangerous came out and that gave me a hasty re-edit of various bits and pieces in order to make it match. But hey, there we go. So what do we, what do we aim, what do we get? Well, Elite Dangerous, um, I'm going to go into my private. I've been in this for a while. There we go. Um, yeah, Elite Dangerous um, definitely hooked up on the previous games to to quite a degree. It was, um, you know, you can you can have a Cobra Mark III. I mean, you don't start in one. You start in a Sidewinder, um, which is the basically the bottom of the the ship chain. Um, and here I am at Obsidian Orbital. There we go. Um, and I've got a friend request again. There we go. Um, and you know, so first things first. What you what you get with Elite Dangerous, of course, is is much much better graphical fidelity. Surprise, surprise. You know, <laughs> seventeen years has gone by. Um, it would be a bit surprising if the graphics hadn't got better. Um, you get full sound. You get VR capabilities. You get the ability to look around your cockpit, and you know, the, the graphics are much better. Okay, but essentially, a lot of the stuff is very similar. So even going back to that regional game, okay, the original nineteen eighty four game. Um, the idea of launching from the space station, you know, it was just a series of concentric rings, but, you know, we still launch from the space station. It's still, uh, I mean, obviously this isn't a Coriolis space station, we're here at Obsidian Orbital because that happens to be where I am. Um, and uh, oh, I've got my hotel set wrong, which is always a good way to start, there we go. <laughs> my flying skills, as you can see, remain legendary. Um, I'll just have a little bit of sound, there we go. And yeah, we fly, we fly out of the docking bay, but you know, and we're in space. Okay, so that's kind of you know, you know, the idea of having a spaceship leaving the space station and then you know being um, in space, you know, and the, the space station is still rotating. Okay, uh, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, we still have lasers. Um, notice that um, uh, we don't we don't see it here, but if I, um, I think if I, there we go. Uh, I uh, just flipped it through. Um, 
I think I need to be in hyperspace actually. So let me just do a hyperspace jump um, because it allows me to show it to you. Let's just go somewhere close by, it doesn't really matter where. Uh, there we go. Oh, that's a Yep, so mass locking, actually mass locking um, is again something from the original game, 1984, the idea of mass lock came from the original game, so um, there's lots of little nods like that. Now actually I don't even need to hyperspace here, look, notice on, on the HUD here, where's my mouse, there it is, oh you can't see my mouse on that screen, that's annoying, but anyway, um, the HUD is still very similar, okay, you've got that 3D scanner arrangement, you've got a speed indicator, you've got a shield indicator, uh, you've got that compass, that compass is still there. Um, uh, it's in a slightly different locale, but you know, lots and lots of UI elements carried over from the original game, which is always quite nice for the old school guys to see. You've still got fuel scoops, um, you can still be mass locked, you can hyperspace to various different places. All that sort of stuff is the same. It's a hugely impressive homage to the original game. Um, um, they've also worked hard to combine the um, flying dynamics of the first game. Now, in this game, if I fly around in a, in a circle, then I'm sort of, uh, particularly um, if I go to this throttle setting, I'm sort of airplanes in space, okay? So my ship will automatically adjust, um, you know, heading um, for me. Um, I can, of course, fly backwards as well, but with flight assist off, I can get a feel for the, am I gonna shoot this station? No. <laughs> um, you know, with flight assist off, I get some of that Newtonian mechanics that I had in the second and the third game. Um, so if I want to muck around with those kind of things, I can. Um, so there's little bits of you know um, gameplay nods to both of those versions to give some of those, um, those those kind of flexibilities back into the game. We have the ability to you know open a galaxy map, uh, and we've now got. And this, this this I think is one of the biggest achievements of Elite Dangerous. It still boggles my mind that they managed to do this. Is we have a a galaxy map which is actually about as close to realistic as you can possibly be. No other game has achieved this, um, to my knowledge. This remains hugely impressive. You know, there are 400 billion stars out there um, and an awful lot of them based on actual real stellar data. Um, and uh, this is generated by something in the game called the Stellar Forge, which sounds awfully exciting. It's probably just a uh, yeah, lump of code. But I kind of imagine this holographic user interface to the Stellar Forge, which <laughs> it's just probably a romantic view. But um, yeah, th those are the sort of capabilities that are in there. And Michael Brooks, bless him, um, worked on this for a long, long time to plot all this sort of stuff out and, and make it happen. So this galaxy that we can traverse is is a is a remarkable achievement in of itself. Um, you know, it's it's three dimensional. Um, we can fly to realistic places in the galaxy and, and and you know do that sort of stuff. And it you know it's big. It takes time to get across. Um, so um, so yeah, that stuff's very impressive. Um, the system map um, looks very 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 familiar when it when it loads. Um, apart from all the fleet carriers. <laughs> We've got a very similar structure to the previous game to go and look up the information and so on and so forth. When we're in the space station, we can take missions. Um, the missions aren't um, as well written, I don't think, as the previous games. There's less imagination being shown there. It's a little bit more, um, you know, rather than, uh, by the way, I need you to take some stuff to uh, you know, the starport over there. And uh, yeah, it might be a little bit dodge, but don't worry about it, you know what I'm saying. In Elite Dangerous, it tends to be take the, uh, take X tons of cargo to space station X Y, and you'll be paid when you return. It's a bit bland and a bit dry. Um, those newspapers, um, they're not in they're not in Elite Dangerous. Um, so that was a that was quite a surprise. I think that those sort of things weren't going to be put into the game. Um, I remember me and some of the other writers being kind of like, well, "Really, you're not going to do that?" Because you know, we consider that to be one of the highlights of the previous games. Okay, that the fact that there'll be newspapers in the game reporting on, you know, antics of various bits and pieces. Now, it may be that that's something we lost simply because of the multiplayer aspect. Because obviously, with the single-player game, the campaign is on rails to a degree. Um, yeah, maybe with a few, you know, splits here and there. Um, whereas in Elite Dangerous, how can you possibly keep track of, you know, hundreds of thousands of players all doing stuff? Um, and so we lost that um, campaign style of things in Elite Dangerous because it became a multiplayer game. So, um, you know, we, we gained a lot through multiplayer. We gained a lot of, um, 
you know, the ability to fly with our mates. You know, <laughs> that had never been a thing before in Elite. Um, but we lost we lost the story to quite a degree because, um, you know, what is the story of Elite Dangerous? Well, obviously, you know, Galnet, okay, Galnet. Um, now, what is Galnet? Now, Galnet is, isn't quite a newspaper. It's sort of a, a feed that you get in your ship. Um, and every so often, it will comment on things by actual real newspapers. You'll notice occasionally the Imperial Herald gets mentioned, um, um, you know, for the Empire in particular. But um, there isn't there isn't that much flavour text that gets added into Elite Dangerous you know, outside of that. Now, Galnet tells you some stuff, um, and um, but it doesn't it doesn't have that. Um, narrative what I, what I suppose we call narrative consistency that connects all sorts of things together it just it, you know it's a very hard thing to do you would have to have um, a series of full-time writers involved to make Galnet as good as the other newspapers in the previous games were for a single-player campaign in a multiplayer in, in environment um, there's an awful lot of stuff that isn't that isn't fleshed out. That's a very good point, um, Commander Ulos. So many systems in the description. So, for example, if we we have a look around the galaxy map, the bubble is you know is an area of space. Now, if we look at Maya, um, we get we get we get a description. This system was first colonized with the construction of Obsidian Noble in November 3301. Cool. Um, you know, other places that uh, are, are relative. I mean, the Prism system. I put the description of this one in because this is the one from my book. Um, um, odd enough, a slight nod to me, as you might expect. I mean, come on, you're going to get to the designer star system, you might as well get your name on it, okay? Uh, Keone was a pleasant pastoral moon until the prism system was seized by the Loren lineage um, in 3297. The system remains unstable this time, and traders are advised to proceed with caution. Okay, so that's that's what about that system. Next door to it is is another system. Um, now, this one's actually in my book, Heoria System. Uh, but there is no description. What happens here? We don't know. Nothing's going on. Um, there are uh, 52,096 people, but they don't apparently do anything of note. <laughs> um, here's another one. In the Empire, uh, no system description is available. Um, no system description is available. There's an awful lot of um, empty worlds where apparently nothing is going on. Um, in fact, that one looks like that's the, the current CG down there, and um, there is no system description either. Okay, um, I can go to Gateway. Uh, Gateway is is the original uh, starting point of the third game. Um, there we go. Um, and again, you know, this is this is in the law quite an important system. No system description. Okay. Um, T and Isla, arguably the entire start point of the the law in the game, um, <laughs> has the system description from the 1984 game. <laughs> this system is very notable for its habitants' innate shyness. <laughs> and and Lave um, is again only has the description from the original game. Now Lave again is a massively massively significant system in the law. Okay, Lave is famous for its vast rainforest and the now extinct Lavian tree grub. Only it isn't extinct. <laughs> and you need to dig into the law to find that one. Um, so if it's not procedurally generated, it would take a long time. It would. It would. Um, and um, this is one of the things I think is my first uh, kind of disappointment with Elite Dangerous. Um, I think a lot of it is absolutely fantastic. But one of the things that we, th we, we were told a lot about during the Kickstarter was the magic of procedural generation. Now, procedural generation is very good at some things. You know, procedurally generating planet surfaces and procedurally generating system names and all that kind of good stuff. Um, it's less good, um, or at least so far it seems to be less good at generating meaningful um, descriptions of things. Now, in the original game, a lot of those descriptions were put together with procedural generation using very, very simple kind of structures like planet, um, very populated by um, thing, um, who have a random selection of verbs and then noun. Okay, so it's, it's yeah, that's how it was done. Um, and um, you know all those sort of things were um, you know uh, aspects of the original game. Now the procedural generation in Elite Dangerous isn't used as much. Um, there, there doesn't seem to have been as much effort in the procedural generation to populate meaningful stuff um, in those kind of things. And there's a lot of lore 
um, from the original games that just simply isn't in the Elite Dangerous. Um, the biggest, biggest example, of, and I've highlighted Tian Isla because this is this is my one of my biggest bugbears with Elite Dangerous you know, from from the point where you start. It doesn't pay appropriate homage to the original games um, lore. So Tian Isla and Lave are hugely, hugely significant to Elite, you know the entire Elite franchise's lore, and most of the stuff that is in the lore about these two systems isn't in Elite Dangerous, which is a bit of a shame, I think. Um, now, you know, it's a frontiers game at the end of the day, and we can only, we can only comment on it. But um, yeah, and there's a lot of really really good stuff. I mean, the skybox, the sound, the flight dynamics, the ships, the graphics, um, you know, fan absolutely fantastic. They look exactly on on spec for what you kind of would imagine it to be. Um, but the the law is is very mutable. In Elite Dangerous is very very mutable as well. So um, you know classic things that should be there, which um, you know here was an opportunity to do it properly. The Tian is orbital graveyard is where the story of Elite actually starts. Okay, um, so um, you know the entire origin of the Dark Wheel, Tian Isla. Okay, the beginning is of Raxler, Tian Isla. Um, the first ever Cobra Mark III that we come across, Tia Isla, okay, and Lave, depending on which aspect you're looking at. Those things are very, 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 very fundamental to the entire story of, of, of Elite. Uh, and, and yet, in Elite Dangerous, you just wouldn't know that, okay? There's no, there's no history associated with these things. There's no way for you to go and learn about the law um, in, in the Elite Dangerous game. There's, there's, there's some stuff, okay? Um, and the Codex wasn't originally in Elite Dangerous, okay? The Codex is a relatively new thing. So the Codex does give you a bunch of stuff, and the knowledge base is, is you know, the main area for, for law in Elite Dangerous, if you want to go and look at it. Now, this, on the surface of it, actually looks quite good. Um, so, you know, there's, there's an entry for the Dark Wheel, and there's an entry for Raxler, and there's an entry for the Empire and the Federation and stuff, okay? Now, these were updated, and there's, when you read it, they, they you know, they've got a few subcategories and a bunch of text. Okay, so it's not, it's not all that sophisticated, um, and there's some interesting stuff in here, no doubt. Uh, and I've read through it many times. The problem is, it's never ever been expanded. Okay, it's never ever uh, been expanded at all. So um, there is nothing new about Raxler ever since this codex entry was made. So this codex has become a static thing, and has never and has never. Um, Never, never been added. Uh, the Dark Wheel is the same. So there's a nod to the law, but it hasn't been embraced. It hasn't been embraced. And that is probably my biggest criticism of Elite Dangerous overall. The game works fantastically well. Um, but unlike the previous game that involved you in the, in the story of the galaxy, and unlike the original game, which set a lot of foundations for the law, um, Elite Dangerous doesn't really do law properly. <laughs> it sort of, it sort of does and sort of doesn't. But it, it's very inconsistent, and law gets retconned as well. So some events that did take place in Elite Dangerous now haven't taken place, and certain characters who did things certain haven't done things, and certain story arcs that were originally being um, you know, written about through Galnet came to nothing and disappeared. Um, so the law has been treated very inconsistently in Elite Dangerous. Um, and the, the upshot of that, it, it may not bother you at all. It may not bother you at all. But the upshot is that um, if you're the sort of player who f wants to feel part of the universe and, and the law and the story that's going on around you is important to your gameplay, your immersion, dare, dare I say that word, um, is um, it gives you a sense of emptiness. Um, everything looks fantastic, everything looks pretty, but there's, a, there's, a, there's an emptiness, there's a void in the void, <laughs> which the game sort of feels slightly soulless, and that's, that's the best way I can describe it. Um, and in the early days, it was better than it is now. So in the early days, we had mysteries being injected into the game in a regular way. Now, dear old Michael Brooks was a big fan of mysteries, okay? So um, strange containers and strange signals would appear. And, um, you know, the early stuff with the Thargoids before they actually turned up, 
Um, you know, we have weird things on planets and then, you know, strange signals and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, those things were happening. Now, some might complain that those puzzles were a bit too difficult for some players to get access to. And I think that's a criticism that's reasonable. Um, um, but um, then, that, then that faded away and there was a, there was a period not that long ago, um, probably, you know, ending about this time last year, um, where there had been no story for months and months and months. Galnet just was switched off. It was like the galaxy came to a halt. And, and you know, uh, and and you know, stuff like that. Now it's it's totally permissible, obviously, for you to go and write your own story and, and do things in the Elite Dangerous Universe yourself and write your own lore and stuff. Um, but norm the the best games provide lore so that you can base your story off it. Um, now, lore should be, in my humble opinion, relatively immutable, and you should work with the wackiness of your lore in your your franchise or your game um, to. You know, and then you, the narrative, all sorts of narratives can come off the law, but the law is the foundation for narrative. And I think, I feel, and I, I've, you know, I've interacted with Frontier a number of times. I've written two books, one of which I wrote for them under commission. Um, at times they got it, they understood it, the, you know, the importance of the law. And at other times they've just gone, nah, we're not, we're not, we're not doing law. Um, world building uh, or universe building, as it is here, you know, it's it's a staggering technical achievement but it lacks soul. And if there was a bit more soul to Elite Dangerous, I think it would be, it would be that much, much more of a, of a, of a fantastic thing. It, it has huge amounts of, um, you know, impressive stuff in it. Um, I like the dynamics of, you know, hyperspace. I like the dynamics of, you know, um, you know, landing on the planet's surfaces and having a look around. But every time you do these things, you, you kind of enjoy the process, but you kind of, almost left with a slight, I suppose it's ennui, kind of like, I want this to be significant in some way. And it just isn't, you can't make your mark on the on the universe. Now, contrast that with the previous game. Now, Frontier First Encounters was, was absolutely diabolical in a number of ways, but you could make your mark on the universe. You could get yourself into the news and effectively within your version of the game that you were playing, you became part of the law because you were, you were either the hero or the anti-hero or the, the dastardly assassin or all those sort of things. Um, so that is part of the Elite Dangerous vibe. It doesn't really happen in Elite Dangerous. Now it's very difficult because Elite Dangerous is now multiplayer. So how could we all have a part in, in the story? It's, it's impossible, isn't it? Um, so attempts were kind of made to engender that. So things like uh, in the early days, um, we had you know we had wings. We had um, uh, one of the first things that was added to Elite Dangerous actually was community goals, which I think is one of the better additions. Um, and so early on, things like those kind of sophistications were being added into the base game. So community goals was one of the first ones. Then we had wings that came along, um, which allowed us to wing up and do things as a group, and then missions that were kind of wings. And then. Um, then it all went a little bit weird. We had CQC, which is you know, um, um, yeah, something I've pretty much avoided to be honest. <laughs> That's kind of scratching my head when that got added to the game. That may have just been because Microsoft required it to you know allow them to put it Elite Dangerous on the Xbox. I'm not sure, maybe. Um, and uh, after that, we got um, I think I'm right in saying we got engineers um, and engineers, particularly in its early early instance I felt was a wasn't was a bit of a miss um, I don't mind it so much now that you know the the effects are cumulative but um, it was one of those very well like what I call very gamey things okay you've got to write okay so you've got to go and cobble together a bunch of really really odd things um, which for some strange reason you can't buy with credits um, <laughs> <laughs> you have to take him to this 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 guy or this girl on some you know some uh, bizarre place, who will wave some magic over your components and turn them into <laughs> upgrades for your ship. Um, now that's <laughs> that isn't that isn't how engineering works. <laughs> that's that's called magic. <laughs> so if they had been called space wizards, it would have been <laughs> much better in my humble opinion, uh, because that is not engineering, okay? Um, and and then you know the problem with that was it was it was a gamification of of elite. Now, elite always had. I mean, it is a game, okay? I, I'm I'm under no um, <laughs> I'm under no um, 
you know, illusions that this is a game, okay? I, I know it's not real. Um, but the Elite, in all of its incarnations, took its own internal consistency quite seriously, okay? So in the original game, um, you know, you, you had your basic upgrades, um, uh, and, you know, they were consistent. So a military laser was always better than a beam laser, and a beam laser was always better than a pulse laser. Um, and, you know, you had um, an ECM system that would counter missiles. But the ECM system came with a cost. It drained your energy really fast. So if you used it too much, you, you could be in trouble. Um, you know, so all those things. And it kind of made sense, okay? It kind of made sense. You know, you, you, in order to, in the original game, there was nothing other than credits, okay? So if you wanted to buy stuff, you had to go and earn some money. That, 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 that makes sense, okay? That's, that's logical. In the second and the third game, um, there was only credits. Um, there, was, there was no other currency in game, okay, to go and do things with. Um, the only thing the second and third games did add was a grind, I suppose, if you, we didn't call it that back in the day, but you, know, you had to go and do missions for the Empire and the Federation in order to get your rank improved with either group. Um, so, and as you did, as your rank with those superpowers increased, you would get you know, more lucrative and more interesting missions. So there was a sort of currency in the game to kind of do those things, but those sort of made sense. You know, if you, if you come and work for us, uh, and do some, you know, stuff, then we trust you a bit more, we'll give you better mission. That, that's logical, that makes sense, okay? Um, the, you know, the names of the ranks are a bit weird, you know, <laughs> you become an admiral, really? <laughs> or you become a king, I think, in the, in the Empire. The ranks are a bit, I mean, maybe it's an honorary title, not a real title, but, you know, at least that made sense, okay? We've, we've developed a bit of a relationship here. Uh, we've conferred you the uh, honorary rank of Admiral in the Federal Navy. Therefore, we trust you to do important stuff for us and, and you've proved yourself in the past to be reliable. That makes sense, that's logically consistent, okay? Um, and then in Elite Dangerous, we have the concept of the engineers who are, who are basically space wizards, all right? <laughs> and that was, I remember watching this thinking, I don't, this, this is too gamey. This is too. This isn't. This isn't quite in the spirit of Elite, because Elite was logically consistent um, bef before that point. And Elite and, 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 and engineers. There's just no way for you to to, to make the logic of the system. I've, I've got engineering stuff on my ship now. Right now, so um, you know, I don't know what I've got. Yeah, you know, I've got. I've got some stuff. Okay. <laughs> Arsenic, for some strange reason, okay, is um, is really really rare in the Elite Dangerous universe. But um, you know, um, I've got um, I don't know, I've got loads and loads of carbon. Carbon's good. Um, I've got some chemical manip. I don't, you know, what do these things do? I, I, don't, I have no idea. Um, and amazingly, I've you know, here's another thing that's just not consistent. Okay, when I die, and and I have died a few times in Elite Dangerous, um, in my ship gets blown up. Okay. I get magically teleported back to um, a space station in a, in a manner that's not explained in the law because in the original games you had escape pods, okay? Um, but in this game, um, it's not entirely clear <laughs> how you escape. Um, it's obviously something very, very good uh, because you'd get teleported back to whatever space station you last accessed, uh, which is truly totally convenient and obviously, you know, in a, in a game context, you have to have a way to respawn. I, I get that. Um, but any cargo that I'm carrying is destroyed, okay? My ship is destroyed and I have to, my insurance has to buy it back. That's that's okay, that makes sense. Um, and, um, um, you know, any mission that I was doing when I was destroyed, I failed, I've lost that mission. Okay, I, that, that seems fair, okay? Because I'm, I'm dead, <laughs> or at least my ship has gone. But curiously enough, all of these weird things that I'm carrying, um, um, remain. <laughs> now, none of these things appear, now, you know, the explanation perhaps for these things is actually they're not actually things, they're sort of references to things. So maybe it's like a shopping list of things that I've seen, but that doesn't quite wash uh, with me because quite a lot of these things I have scooped up from the surface of planets like at Dav's Hope. Um, and uh, they are physical things that I picked up in my SRV and then transferred to my ship. Uh, but apparently they take no mass and no space. Um, and they, they follow me around when I die, <laughs> or at least when I get teleported off my, my destroyed ship. Um, it's just, it doesn't make any logical sense, okay? It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a magic pocket. And for these things, um, you know, um, data, 
makes sense. If it was all data, that that's reasonable. I mean, there's no reason in the future why I couldn't have, you know, a massive, you know, a, a hard disk or a SSD or a, you know, whatever the 34th century equivalent is. Um, to um, you know, to be stored on my person that I take with me. Data makes sense, but these these materials don't make sense at all. Okay, so how can I, how can I possibly be carrying a whole bunch of materials with me all the time, <laughs> like, unless they're microscopically small? Um, um, and you know, they're in. Okay, so they, maybe they're insured and replaced. Okay, well, why isn't my cargo <laughs> insured and replaced? You know, I mean, even today, you know, if a ship sinks at sea. Uh, and I've worked in insurance, so I know how this works. Um, you know, you have different insurers for different things. Somebody insures the ship and somebody insures the cargo. That's the way it works. So there's no reason why my cargo can't be replaced as well, if that happens to be what I was carrying. Um, so you know, there are odd choices and they're not, and, and this isn't, you know, I mean, we could probably pick all sorts of holes in these sort of things, but um, they're not logically consistent. That's my point. Um, and they kind of wind me up <laughs> a little bit. Now there is lots of other good stuff. I like the synthesis. Um, you know, I'm I love the exploration part of Elite. Now we also used to love exploration in the previous Elite, but there wasn't really anything to go and see because the games were so limited. Today there is lots of stuff to go and see. There's nebulas and all sorts of stuff like that, um, planets and various other bits and pieces. That's very cool. I like that a lot. Um, we can still trade. We can still fight. We can still explore. We can still bounty hunt, and we can kind of pirate things. Um, you know, but engineers was the first time I remember thinking, what, what, what's going on here? You, what, we, so we can take magic stuff and apply magic effects to our ships. And I don't think Elite Dangerous ever really recovered its balance um, after the engineers. Um, it became very much a, a meta game of, of engineering um, loadouts. Prior to, prior to engineers, all you had to do is you had you know the the A to E rated modules on your ship, and actually that I felt in some ways was better because you know everybody would usually go if you were into combat you'd go for A rated stuff okay because it was fast as powerful you know quick is better etc. If you were an explorer you tended to use mostly D modules with a few A's to give you the maximum jump range um, and um, you know all those sorts of things. Um, and then, you know, so if you were in an A-rated anaconda and you came across another A-rated anaconda, the person who is going to be the one who wins that fight is going to be the one who has the most skill, okay? <laughs> as simple as that. Uh, or luck, or strategic advantage, or planning, or whatever it happens to be. Um, whereas today, um, with engineering, for, you know, certainly for me, I mean, I, there's no point me even trying to PvP. Um, in Elite Dangerous in open mode because I simply do not have the time to pursue a meta build for engineering. I just you know I just don't have the time. It would just take me too long and I've got better things to do with my life. So um, PvP, even if I wished to take part in it in open mode, um, the sheer amount of work I would have to do to engineer my ship to, to a point where it would even be vaguely comparable uh, you know or competitive. Is, is out of my is kind of out of my reach, and I'd have to do so much meta work to figure out exactly what PvP build I would need on which particular ship. It, uh, you know, it's just a, whereas in the olden days, all I'd do is right, I'm going to A rate an Anaconda and choose my weapons and go, um, right, okay, let's <laughs> make the best man win. Um, you know, it was more fun. Okay, it was more accessible. Um, and engineering has taken that away from me, so I can't, I, you know, I can't do PvP because I just don't have the time, and, and I would be killed all the time because I'm not a particularly good combat pilot. But um, it's, it's 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 inaccessible now because of engineers, uh, which I think is a shame. I think it's a shame. Um, power play was another one whereby we had the, you know, the the initial idea was good. It's like here's a political reason to be in a faction, um, and. Um, you know, so we could we could support Ashling Deval, or we could support uh, Senator the Patriots, or something like that, and that gave you a reason to role play. Now that is good law, okay? Um, you know, the idea that there is a political power in the universe for you to align yourself with and do things—that's that's good law. You can build narrative on that, and many many player groups have done exactly that. Um, so that that's a good thing. Now our power play, um, when it first came along, the only criticism I had of it is. Where the hell did these guys come from? <laughs> Suddenly, boom! These people exist in the Elite Dangerous universe. And uh, what were they doing last week? Uh, well, we don't talk about that. 
Well, no, 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 no. Hang on. <laughs> they must have. Got, well, why? Why is okay? What? What did? What did Fleet Admiral Patrius do before he was a Fleet Admiral? In fact, who? <laughs> What's his backstory? Yeah, where does he come from? Where was he born? What does he do? What sort of stuff has he done in the past? What kind of guy is he? Um, nah. <laughs> Didn't do any of that. In fact, when I wrote Premonition, I asked Frontier, okay, you know, because I want to put some of the power play characters in the book, and they are, you know, Sensor Patrius, uh, Ashling Duval, um, Hudson, um, Arissa, and Edmund Mahon, the Alliance guy. They were all in Premonition. OK, and um, I, I said to Frontier, <laughs> OK, so what's the backstory? You must have something. What's the backstory on these power play characters? And they went, no, they're just pictures. <laughs> and that's literally all there was. There was no law background to the power play characters at all. I had to make it all up myself and I submitted it for approval. Um, the stuff that I put together and I was I was really, really surprised and a little bit kind of dismayed to find out that there was no background to these characters whatsoever that just doesn't exist um, so the character as you as you read them in premonition um, that is entirely me going well Patrius what kind of guy is he and Ashling what kind of you know why she got blue hair and what kind of attitude does she really have because um, th there wasn't anything um, and that that is the thing now that's happened again with Elite Dangerous Odyssey and something I've complained about in the past so you know all these new organizations Apex Interstellar okay um, into Astra, uh, Frontier, whatever it is, the, the place that gives you your guns. Um, all of these things, suddenly these organizations have appeared in the game, all right? And um, you know, where were they before? Were they already there? Do they, you know, you know why haven't we heard of them? There, there is no law, okay? And Frontier just don't seem to do law, okay? That, you know, which is a real shame because you just need a little bit of flavour text, a little bit of background on these organisations. You know, are they trustworthy? Are they to at the moment we don't know? I mean, Apex Interstellar makes taxis, so um, but well, you know, have they got a monopoly on taxis? How come they've got a monopoly on taxis? You know, all of that sort of stuff. Um, it doesn't take much effort to put a little bit of flavour and go, okay, well, okay, so Inter Astra is is uh, is an organisation which is very um, aggressive and is, is taken over you know, everybody else uh, or Apex, you know, front uh, frontline solutions. You know, what's their bag? Okay, um, <laughs> they they take people off the street um, um, and allow them to jump onto vultures and go into combat zones. <laughs> Why? <laughs> All that sort of stuff. Okay, that needs a little bit of law. Okay, just to, to ground it. Where do these Where do these organisations come from? And um, power play was introduced with nothing. Okay, and um, uh, the engineers had a little bit of preamble. Um, all this new stuff in Odyssey, there's no preamble, at least at the moment. We haven't seen any alpha. Maybe there's going to be some in the full game, but I won't hold my breath, to be honest, about those organisations. Um, they should have been in here, um, you know, already. Um, we should have seen them in the Codex. There's a place for them. Go into the Codex, go into the knowledge base. Um, you know, here, corporations, boom. They could have appeared in there and um, we'd all be going, ooh, 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 new stuff's happening, what's all that? Who's Apex Interstellar and who's Frontier? You know, they don't exist. Maybe they will in the full version. Maybe there'll be a reference in here, but it's kind of a little bit too late. And there's a bunch of stuff in here. You know, for example, the Sirius Corporation is, is a really, really important corporation in the law of elite. Um, goes back a long, long way. And they've got a very, very dodgy, shady history. OK, um, but other than this, um, single entry in the codex, you just wouldn't know. Um, you know, Falcon de Lacy, Gutemar, we know some of these from the, um, um, you know, the ship designs, we know that. Uh, but many of the other ones here, Achilles Corporation, Kane Massey, um, Mastopolis Mining, all quite important names in the law if you go and dig it up. But do they have any impact on Elite Dangerous today? But, they, you know, there is, there, is, there is law in there that could be used, but just isn't, <laughs> which is a shame. Um, and Recon, Recon Construction, that's a, that's a big one too. Uh, Universal Cars of Graphics is in there. I mean, and there's a big one missing here. I mean, where is the Pilots Federation? Probably the most important one of the lot. Doesn't even have an entry. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so, you know, so that stuff, you know, this, this, this bit I thought was, um, you know, going to be really quite interesting, but it, 
it didn't really get fleshed out. It's very basic, uh, which is a shame. Um, um, Krilikov says, I fear the passion of the storyteller left the project with Michael Brooks. I had a lot of time for Michael Brooks because he got what made Elite great, at least for many, many players. Now, you know, you know, we got to counter that criticism of Elite with the fact that Elite Dangerous actually now is more popular than it's ever been. Okay, there are more players in Elite Dangerous than there have ever been. Frontier as a company, as a business, is more successful and more profitable than it's ever been. So clearly they're doing something right from a measure of financial performance. Okay, so any conceivable, you know, what, what, what in business speak we talk about KPIs, okay, key performance indicators. Uh, if any measurable way, Elite Dangerous, if from that perspective, has been a resounding success. So who are we, or who am I, because uh, it's me waffling on, to criticise that? Um, and I can't. I can't criticise the fact it's been a financial success. You know, it's made Frontier millions of pounds. So, and David Braben is a millionaire, okay, a multi-millionaire, and he has an OBE. So, <laughs> I mean, by any, by any reasonable thing, that's pretty darn successful. Okay, there's no. I'm pretty sure there's nobody else on the chat, uh, including myself, who is a multi-millionaire with an OBE. Okay, so he's done all right, has David Braben. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> so an elite, an elite dangerous has to. It is a very successful thing, um, in terms of a another spaceship game where you can fly around a realistically sized galaxy in a spaceship. Uh, and do stuff, it has no competition, there is nothing else. I mean, you, you could cite No Man's Sky, and I, I like No Man's Sky, but um, it's not in a real place. And that, you know, whilst I actually quite like the planet landing and exploration stuff in No Man's Sky, because it isn't set in a real universe, I don't find it as compelling. I, I like it, but I don't find it as compelling. Um, Elite's greatest thing for me is the fact that it's set in the real universe. Uh, but the other thing that I think it has, which I feel has always been tragically underused, is that storytelling lore aspect that the game has. Um, Elite Dangerous has the same sort of lore and background potential as Star Wars or Star Trek did. Now those franchises are obviously TV and film franchises, less so computer games, but um, um, you know they, they make use of of that law, and they and they they you know they get their fans to obsess over the law because they throw things into it and, and, and make more of it and, and make mysteries out of the law and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, so um, you know that that sort of stuff is is they they get how valuable it is. Elite Dangerous has never, at least to my way of thinking, you know the 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 people creating the game have never quite grasped the the essence. Of what's underneath, and um, they've made a wonderful thing, but they could make it so much better, and more profound, and more more meaningful by just embracing that a bit more. It's just you know, it's a perennial thing. I've been saying that for years, and <laughs> nothing has changed. So, um, so you know, so engineers, power play, like that sort of stuff, uh, and then obviously we eventually got to horizons. Um, uh, Rootra, partially agreed away, but lately this has changed for better. Yeah, you know, we have got we have got uh, more dynamicism into Galnet once again. It's come back, and they've added, you know, CGs that push stories around. That that's good. Yeah, and I'm glad to see that's come back. Um, you know, I'd be following those things and taking part in a few of the CGs, and that, that has been fun. So there is more there. You know, I've got to I've got to I've got to say that that has come back recently. Um, so we kind of got up to where well, we got up to power play and explore. So. Powerplay I kind of quite liked. The only thing I didn't like about Powerplay was this. Uh, there's another thing that didn't make any logical sense to me. Okay, so here we are um, in the core worlds on a scanner. If I switch it to Powerplay mode, okay, then the then the universe of Powerplay comes into existence. There it is. Okay, so this is this is the, this is what Powerplay looks like today. And whilst you know whilst the coloured blobs have changed hands quite a bit since the early days, in fact, it looks like it's a complete mess now, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> In fact, there's mostly empire stuff there, and then there's a lot of green, which I think is Alliance, and then um, I think, what's this, uh, Lee Yong Long Ru, I can't remember who he works for now. Uh, you know, it's, it's moved around a bit, but you know, here is, you know, um, the, the power play map. Now, the thing that, that, does, that kind of winds me up about this is there's a bunch of organizations, okay, fighting over this relatively small bubble of space. Okay, for you know, and what would we be fighting for? Okay, political influence and resources are the only things that really make sense. Okay, um, when um, minutes away, literally by hyperspace, minutes away at most, 
is 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 resource beyond all possible dreams of Everest. So why bother expending all your <laughs> your your efforts fighting over a contested area of space when there is an entire galaxy of <laughs> resource to go and go and go and pinch stuff from you know um that makes no sense to me at all so um you know it would have been lovely to see power play expand out into all sorts of directions well you say it's people but this isn't this isn't just um i mean it's where the people are this is this is the bubble i suppose but um in the years since it should have expanded quite dramatically um because you know we've got spaceships and we've got cruise ships and we've got you know things and stuff that um, can travel these distances out to here in just a few minutes so why why isn't the unit why isn't the human bubble expanding dramatically every year it should it should be ticking bigger and bigger and bigger all the time um, humans don't stay when 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 resources are under contention um, people spread out <laughs> and go and find new stuff um, so I don't, I don't know maybe, maybe it makes sense maybe it doesn't but um, um, uh, and the you know, Colonia, of course, is another thing that that, that happened, uh, but there's no power play out there. So that that one I always felt was a is a bit again a little bit artificially constrained. But I do actually quite like power play after all these years in the sense that it's it's a it's a reason to do something, which I think is good. The background simulation is another reason to do something that's quite good. Um, the Thargoids, when they eventually turned up with the high predictions, very scary. I like that, I thought that was very good. Um, you know, and the Thargoids are a very much a part of the Elite Dangerous law. Um, mysteries and things in the game. Okay, so I mean, we we have to talk about um, Raxler for a moment. Um, you know, Raxler is the perennial elite mystery that goes right back to the original game. Um, it's been hinted at. It's been mentioned many, many times. It's in the Codex. Okay, so they can't deny it's in the game. Kind of in a way, there it is, Raxler. There's a you know, what is Raxler? Nobody knows. Okay, um, we've been given nothing, as far as I'm aware, really at all about Raxler in all this time. Um, so, will Odyssey bring anything more to the Raxler story? We'll have to wait and see. But um, so that's the thing. The Guardians. The Guardians was an excellent addition. Um, yeah, I like that kind of whole alien race that's been exterminated by the Thargoids in the past and we got to uncover that sort of stuff. And some of the Guardian stuff is very, very good as well. Um, I quite like the Beyond update. You know, the, ex the additional exploration stuff, things to do and see and some weird wacky stuff in space and planets and stuff. You know, that stuff got a thumbs up for me. Um, the only, again, criticism there is it just wasn't procedurally generated. And I fear this is going to be a problem for Elite Dangerous Odyssey is that, you know, lots and lots of handcrafted items have been put in the game um, but yeah when you when you the, the problem is a handcrafted item is lovely to look at the first few times okay and then you've seen them <laughs> and you know for a universe of 400 billion stars 40 80 120 2000 different handcrafted things doesn't cut it I'm afraid it just doesn't cut it this is where the procedural generation needs to the magic needs to happen and Frontier were always the company to do that um, and either procedural gener I, and I'm not a developer so I don't know how difficult this is but either f procedural generation just isn't um, an easy thing to do and make it look convincingly real which is quite strongly a possibility um, or they just don't want to do that maybe <laughs> um, and yeah we've been told there are lots and lots of times as many um, things in Elite Dangerous Odyssey than there were in Elite Dangerous Horizons in terms of things to find but if there's a finite selection of those things it's you know we're gonna be the problem is you quickly begin to feel like you're seeing behind the curtain now no Man's Sky made an attempt at this with procedural generation and, and and some of the stuff it comes up with are quite laughably stupid. But it's it's there's a there's a sense of ambition in No Man's Sky's planets and its you know procedurally generated plants and creatures that even though it's not perfect and even though it's you know in some cases it comes up with some quite ludicrous things, I respect them more for trying because I think you can continually improve that and they, and they are trying to do that. So that is, I think, laudable in the sense it's ambitious. Whereas I think handcrafting a bunch of stuff, whilst they'll look nice, 
um, for a while. I think the problem is there, when you've seen them, you've seen them, you go, oh, I've spotted that thing um, on that planet like three weeks ago. It's the same plant. But why would the same plant evolve on a totally different planet? And then, unless there's some law explanation to hook it all together. So all that sort of stuff, this is this is this is my I suppose you know I'm sort of vaguely coming to a, a, a conclusion on this is that in many places Elite Dangerous really pushes the boundaries. The galaxy map, you know, is is to my mind spectacular. The fact that the backdrop there that we're seeing here in front of the screen is actually kind of generated um, using our x, y, and z coordinates from where I am currently located in the galaxy, and it generates that backdrop. You know, is 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 absolutely stunning to my mind. That is so ambitious and so well done. It's it's hats off, you know, genuinely one of the most impressive things about Elite Dangerous, okay? Um, you know, I'm looking, you know, if I go to Earth, if I go to the Sol system and I look at the stars that are rendered in the backdrop, they are correct, okay? I can make out all the familiar constellations that I, as an amateur astronomer, recognise, and they're all there in Elite Dangerous, and I think that's spectacular. If I go to Alpha Centauri and look back towards Sol, the stars are very subtly shifted as exactly how they should be. That is that is impressive, okay? That I think is a stunning thing. I like the fact that the planets are realistically rendered. You know, we've got we've got impact sites. That's gonna get better with with Odyssey, obviously, with the new planet tech. That is really, really impressive. I think the space combat is pretty good. I mean it's realistic in the sense that, you know, who knows what a spaceship's going to be like in the 34th century, but that is at least internally consistent. Lasers, shields, weapons, missiles, blah, blah, blah. That's, that's all kind of good. Trading stuff from one place to the other all makes sense. Um, you know, planetary bases and things like that, they kind of all make sense as well. Um, so all that sort of stuff shows ambition. You know, the ship design's amazing. The sound effects are amazing. The planet surfaces are pretty good. You know, they're procedurally generated and you can go back and visit the same things time and time again. The multiplayer is actually pretty good. You know, the fact that I can crew up with people and we can fly spaceships together in space and have fun is 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 great. I like that. That is all ambitious stuff and they got it to work. That, you know, hats off, that's fantastic. Where I think it falls over is, um, in the, you know, I've, I've mentioned the law many times. The law isn't good enough, you know. That's, that's a definitive statement. The law isn't good enough. The attention to detail on the law simply isn't good enough. Um, the other stuff where it just doesn't quite feel like the passion is there is the procedural generation of stuff. It just isn't as ambitious as we'd expect it to be. The two things that I think are missing from the procedural generation is some sort of procedural generation of missions where you could have some sort of seed that leads you through a multi-part mission which is procedurally generated so it leads you through a sequence of actions and maybe then it ultimately comes back to the source. Um, there's not enough ambition in the mission system. Okay, The mission system is very deliver XYZ to this place, come back, get paid go over here, assassinate X many pirates, go back, get paid. Um, it's, it's, it, it smacks of not enough ambition. That is, that's always been a weakness, okay? That, that I feel is disappointing. I think the non-procedural generation of things to discover in the game lacks ambition. Um, so those two things I think are, you know, I, I would say that, that, that that's a valid criticism. Now, those problems might be really, really difficult to solve, and I'm sure, and, and perhaps they are. Maybe they're just too difficult for the resources Frontier has, uh, and maybe we're, you know, I'm expecting too much. I don't know, you know, um, it just sometimes feels to me like they overemphasize things. I would gladly trade the entirety of engineers and probably most of the Pew Pew content in Odyssey for a dynamic um, threaded, procedurally generated mission system that could surprise me with, oh, I've got to go over there and do what? Um, you know, I would trade I'd, I'd trade an awful lot of stuff that is in Elite Dangerous. I would give, I would get rid of CQC, I would get rid of engineers. Um, and then there's probably a bunch of other stuff, okay, that I would trade for a really, really interactive, in-depth mission system that could throw up surprises and weird stuff, and I'd have to use my head to figure out a way to solve the mission. I would really, really like that. Um, and the same thing maybe with procedural generation of stuff in deep space. The problem being that you know, once you've seen a few rocky planetoids, um, you have literally seen all of the rocky planetoids. There are a few variations, obviously, but um, you know, that, that stuff, just it just isn't there. Um, 
So, um, and, you know, they've thrown a few things in. There are a few kind of tip-off missions and things like that, which I, you know, the first time they appeared quite like. Um, another thing that's just inexcusable is the NPC dialogue. I mean, it's now become, a, it's such a long-running joke. It's actually become a meme of the game. You know, like this this stream is in the top 1% of all streams. <laughs> And the, and the liners and the, and the wedding barge and all that sort of stuff. I mean, how difficult is it to get a few people to write some NPC dialogue lines? Um, that just, to me, again, is just a, a glaring oversight, which which should be easy to fix and just never has been, is that those NPC dialogues, are, <laughs> I'm going to boil you up. Ah, oh, yeah, that's the ship I'm looking for, the one with the big hull. You know, it's like, really? Again? <laughs> I've seen this message over and over and over again for the last six years. Um, that's, that's not good enough. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> the original games didn't do that. Um, destroyable stuff. Now, here's, here's the other thing. Okay, you cannot make your mark on the Elite Dangerous universe in any meaningful way. Okay, um, you can die, and that's about it. <laughs> you can't destroy a space station. You can't destroy a fleet carrier. You can't destroy a base. Uh, you can't even make a permanent mark on a on a on a you know on a planet. Uh, you can't build your own facility in space. None of the, there's nothing you can do to actually leave a permanent mark. The only way you can leave a permanent mark, actually, is to convince Frontier to put your name on on the galaxy map. I suppose the only thing you can actually do, if arguably, is you can do the first discovered. First footfall is obviously coming, and first scanned thing. That's that's about the only thing you can make. you can make a mark on the galaxy map um, as an entry. Now I'm you know so if I go to uh, uh, actually a system uh, what was it? Um, I can't remember the name of it now. <laughs> my, my own home system. Where is it? Uh, maybe if I just type in Waygard, does that that doesn't work? Um, go ahead, took me out of the game. Um, Ulexia, that's 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 my home system. There we go. So Ulexia system. This is the one I actually got as part of my Kickstarter reward. So the Ulexia system is my home system. So I've got a arguably a mark on the um, on the world on on the game universe here because um, I wrote. Uh, oh, where's it gone? It's disappeared again. Come on, go back to Ulexia. Um, there we are. I wrote this system description here. Ulexia is a system with a single habitable Earth-like moon Eurydice in orbit about the ringed gas giant Tiamoya. It was discovered by the Wegar expedition hey, in 3264. I made that up. Um, the moon is designated as a site of exceptional beauty. Now, okay, I wrote that and that was my pledge award or one of my pledge awards for Elite Dangerous um, to have a, you know, a system you know, with, a, with a bit of description in it. Okay, so um, so I've I've sort of got my mark on the Elite Dangerous Universe, but there's no option for the average player to do that. Um, there is no way for you, um, as a player, to do something in the game that gets your name on a star system or on a spaceport. Okay, that's a privilege to um, you know you know certain people who've for whatever reason, and in my case it was because I you know I did this ridiculous um, brightest pledge thing. Um, to get your name in there, okay, to, to become part of the story of the game, there's no mechanism for most people to do that. Um, um, so, you know, that to me is a shame. That to me is, a, again, a lack of ambition. You know, I, I'm not saying that everybody who ever played Elite should get their name written down somewhere, but, um, you know, if you, you know, for example, things like the Battle of Lou really, really early on. Um, um, you know th th that's become a um, you know a, a marker in the game, which is which is a thing. At least there's a sort of tourist speaking about it. Um, but you know some of the player factions, and I suppose one of the player factions did generate a power play character. So that's that's a significant thing. But you have to do something pretty unusual uh, to get um, you know to get your get your make your mark. And it would be nice. And the one of the things I absolutely love about um, a no man's sky is I can go down to a planet and go I quite like this planet there's a nice beach there um, I can modify the terrain with a terrain modifying tool and I can go right I'm going to build a house and you know I can I can build a house and I can um, yeah I can have a little lawn and I can have a little launch and I can have a little ship and I can park my spaceship next to my house and then I can watch the sun come up you know that that is nice that gives you a sense of um, permanence and ownership now there's 400 billion stars out there <laughs> okay uh, what percentage of 
the universe have we explored? Maybe we had not think we even got to one percent yet, and we've been playing this game for like six, seven years. Um, there is space out there, okay, for all of us to have a small planet each, and there will be plenty of planets left over. And it's a shame, I suppose, in some ways, that Elite Dangerous hasn't embraced that. Okay, go out there as a frontiers person. Uh, and make your mark on the build a base, and it's a shame that that sort of stuff isn't coming. Um, Tia lives the graveyard. Yeah, don't get me started on the Tia lives the graveyard. I've already mentioned that in the stream once. The Tia lives the graveyard is is an unforgivable omission by Frontier. I'm afraid I haven't forgiven them for that, and I think they've been um, they've they've missed out um, atrociously. That you know, Elite Dangerous not having the Tia lives the graveyard is like let's have a store a Star Wars game, but there's no mention of the Force. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just wrong. It's just not acceptable from a law perspective. That is where the whole elite story starts, TNA's La Star system, and it needs to have appropriate homage given to it, and it just doesn't. Um, yeah, so the, the law is, I've, I've mentioned before, the law is a mutable thing. Did they revamp the law? Uh, yes, they did. They cancelled their law. Um, so I was given some relatively detailed law in 2016, it was, um, basically telling me what was a, going to happen in the next sort of 18 months in the game so I could write the book to match the events that were upcoming. So I had a little bit of privilege insider information in the sense that I knew roughly what the Thargoids were going to do when they showed up. Um, so I could write the book um, to align with that story. Now I wasn't allowed to reveal that until the book came out and by the time the book came out the Thargoids had already attacked a player. I think the first player to encounter the Thargoids was on Xbox actually. Um, and so, um, yeah, but I knew that event was coming um, before it actually occurred. And I had, you know, written it, placeholder in the book, and then I just filled out the details of the pilot, the player who was actually actually involved in the time. And, you know, there was a bunch of detailed lore about the way the Thargoids were going to act and what they were going to do. And then after the book came out, um, and a few other bits and pieces, you know, probably about four months later, I think, possibly five months later, um, the end, you yeah, know, the stuff that was supposed to be happening in the law that I had based the book off didn't happen <laughs> and and hasn't happened so the entire set of law that they were following um, in 2016 27 got cut off and you know got, got ended and so uh, never and you know never never materialized and so the Thargoids were promised to be a sort of much more complicated race than um, they were. They eventually came out to be, and all we eventually got in the game was a was a succession of increasingly more fierce and nasty Thargoid ships for us to fight against. There was no nuance really to their behaviour, other than that um, if they they tended to only attack you if you attack them first, which which is kind of nice for aliens. Um, and obviously, they reacted negatively to the Guardian materials that you had on board, um, but. Um, you know, they, they, you know, there were supposed to be two factions of Thargoids, two, two um, um, dynasties, as they were called, of, of Thargoids. And, you know, that complexity and the fact that there was a sort of civil war going on in the Thargoid thing, all of that law that, you know, was there was just thrown away and it hasn't been used. And the Thargoids have been dramatically simplified as a result. Um, another organisation, um, Aegis, who made the AX weaponry, came out of nowhere. They didn't exist. Okay, they didn't exist in 2000. They didn't exist prior to them suddenly turning up and going, guys, um, we, 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 we're here with some AX weaponry. Uh, how about you try that with the Thargoids? There was no, there was no law about Aegis. It just, it was just plucked out of the air as a way to introduce AX weaponry into the game. Okay, so all that, all that business about the Claxians and the Eresrians, it's all gone. It just never happened. Okay, it was supposed to be happening and it just never did. The story got simplified. The law was retconned in a big way and that just never happened and that to me is a shame because if you pull the law out from underneath um, things uh, like that you kind of just go well then then the narrative doesn't make sense it's like Star Wars oh yeah no 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 the force no that never happened the Jedi's no they don't exist what do you mean they don't exist what about that previous film oh yeah well that's 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 yeah, yeah we're, we're, now <laughs> you can't do that and keep your franchise having integrity. Uh, and that is a, a big criticism I will level at Elite Dangerous, is that the game itself is, is actually remarkably good. Yeah, it looks fantastic, but the underpinnings, the, the integrity of the structure and the, the law and the narrative underneath is, is shot to pieces. And it didn't need to be like that. It didn't need to be like that. Um, so, um, 
So yeah, so all that sort of stuff is 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 I think a valid criticism. Now we, then then it kind of leads us on to Odyssey. Okay, so Odyssey is Odyssey is imminent. Um, the same stuff is happening. Okay, all these new organisations, Apex, Interstellar, Interastral, all those sort of things, Frontier, um, Frontline Solutions, all that sort of stuff. Um, no law at all yet. No law at all. Who who are these? Who's running these? You know, for what purpose do they exist? Um, you know, what do these organisations do? What, you know, are they are they profit driven? Because I mean, nobody's going to make money out of Apex shuttles when they get hundred credits for transporting you around. Um, how does that work? Um, what's their purpose? You know, there's no law here at all. Is there any law coming? We'll have to wait and see. There might be. Okay. Um, so um, you know, all that sort of stuff is. Um, is, is not good. I mean, yeah, we, we talk about uh, George Lucas there. So, um, you know, so Star Wars, particularly seven, eight and nine, um, blowing big holes in the law of Star Wars, um, which some fans, myself included, I think got genuinely upset about. Um, you yeah, know, you can argue it doesn't really matter. And of course, it doesn't really matter. It's a game or it's a film. But, you know, if you're going to write a thing, um, I think it's desperately important to keep narrative structure and law intact. And then work with the deficiency. You know, if, if something has happened in the past, some things happened. Okay, we can we can write into the narrative that people pretend it hasn't happened. That's a thing. Okay, that's perfectly reasonable. But to just say no, we're going to scrub that piece of law and say it didn't happen um, means that all the previous stories don't make sense, and you devalue the work that you've already put in. And that I think is a bit of a shame. Um, um, so Elite Dangerous Odyssey, I fear, has the same sort of problems. Is it senses? Okay, so all these organisations appear. We don't know why. We don't know who. You know, what connection do they have with the other things? Um, the game, you know, having played the alpha, I think a lot of things in it are really, really good. I like the space station interiors. I mean, they're a bit limited and a bit samey, and the zero G um, uh, outposts don't make any sense whatsoever. That that feels a bit cheap, um, but. You know, the inter it's, it's nice to stand in the interior of the, you know, the space station and look about and have a look out the windows. That's that's really rather compelling. I quite like that. Um, I really don't like the way the NPCs hang around and go, I am a dodgy mission giver. Come and talk to me. You know, that <laughs> just, just, just doesn't feel at all immersive at all. Um, that, 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 <laughs> particularly when they've got a little light over their head like a Sims character going, dodgy mission givers are us. Um, it's like, really? <laughs> So, yeah, we should, in order to get those missions, we should have to kind of, I don't know, it feels like I want to be able to go into a dodgy part of, 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 of the space station and play a couple of rounds of poker before I get offered the mission. You know, it feels, and maybe that, again, is too ambitious, okay? Um, but um, it just feels very gamey that there'll be all these people hanging around in the corner of the space station going, um, I've got a dodgy mission. <laughs> What what do these guys do when they don't have a dodgy mission? <laughs> you know, and the, the, and the biggest thing there, you can't go to the bar and buy a drink. I mean, that's that's, that's just appalling. What, what's the point of having a bar when you can't buy a drink? <laughs> yeah, you see, the, the bar, um, the, you know, and the bar person. I mean, at the moment, the bar person is sort of the fence for a new set of materials that we're going to have to grind to get stuff. And you can you can kind of see the gamification coming there again, and that's disappointing. It's just more engineers, really, more engineers. Uh, for different stuff. Um, so now we're going to have to go and go to the bartender with some epoxy resin, <laughs> whatever it happens to be, and trade it for some other thing that we need to upgrade our suit. And it's like, and it's just more engineering. It's just, you know, it's it's very unimaginative. It, to me, that's just, that's that's a shame. That, that bit I'm not looking forward to, and I don't think I'll engage with it very much. Um, I like the idea of hanging around the space station, having a chat with various people. I can see lots of gameplay, pace, um, you know, emerging gameplay, generated by us, the players, by hanging around the bar and swapping stories. But um, at the moment, the social options in there aren't very aren't very sophisticated. <laughs> we can sort of do text chat and then we can kind of bow and nod our heads. And that's, a, that's about all we can do. Um, so, um, you know, so that that to me is a bit disappointing. Um, the fact that the bartender, the, see, the bartender is, is effectively a materials trader, as far as I can work out. Um, but the bartender would be far better suited to being the guy who basically said, oh, so you're looking, are you looking, just out of interest, are you looking for some trade stuff? Because I know a guy, um, if you go and, if you go and hang around the, uh, you know, you know, down and down and down near the elevator in five minutes, then, 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 then you know, you, you might see someone who can help you out. That's how that should work. Okay. The bartender is the guy who knows what's going on, you know, if he's any good. 
he you know he sees people come and go doesn't he at the bar and yeah he'll have had a conversation half an hour ago with some guy who said oh I'm desperate for somebody to carry some firearms I know it's illegal right but yeah if you if you know anybody who could prepare to carry some firearms to Leasty then do let me know and then you turn up as the player and the bartender goes you're not going to Leasty are you you know that's how it should work okay well yeah I could be going to Leasty why what uh, well you know um, you know yeah, give me 20 credits and I'll let you know a guy who might be able to sort you out a deal. You know, that's how it should work, all right? <laughs> that sort of stuff is the sort of stuff I was expecting the bartender to do, but it's not like that. It's just, um, you know, bring them some stuff and I'll trade you some other stuff. And, you know, and are those guys hanging around? Yeah, go and talk to them because they're always here. They're offering dodgy missions. It's just, it's not believable. Um, um, uh, you know, yeah. You know, so you know, maybe you need to you need to develop a relationship with those. You know, so these dodgy mission people, they shouldn't come across as dodgy to start with. Okay, they should be okay. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I just I just handle normal trade negotiations. At least if you can carry a few things for me to Leasty, then uh, yeah, that's good. Then I'll, then I'll get sure you get paid. And then as you develop your relationship with said NPC, then after a while he said, you've been really reliable on that Leasty run. Yeah, I've got something here. It's 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 a bit. Yeah, you know, it's a bit under the table. Um, yeah, you know, I'll give you. I can give you five thousand credit or whatever it is. Yeah, um, but yeah, you might run into a little bit of local colour. If we've got to take these things across to Ridquat, that's how it should work. And it, but like, yeah, that would be awesome. That would be awesome because hi, I built up this relation. Now the NPC is giving me some interesting stuff. Okay, but that's what's missing. Okay, there's no soul. It's too gamey. It's too do this, pick up that, bring it back, swap it for that go and rinse and repeat until you get your engineer to that's that's what's wrong with elite dangerous it's just the gaminess um, and it's that lack of soul lack of ambition in that part of the game that bothers me the most it could be so much better and I don't think that stuff's impossible it just needs thought it just needs a bit more care and that bit prioritized over yet another spaceship yet more pew pew yet more cookie cutter stuff I mean, if we took all the, you know, the paint jobs, I mean, do we need all those paint jobs? Really? I mean, they make money. This is the problem, okay? Um, you know, I'd trade all the paint jobs. I'd trade the engineers for that sort of mission structure whereby we could develop a relationship with some semi-permanent NPCs. And then over time, they'd give you more and more interesting missions. Now that, you know, that, that, that would be my vision. <laughs> <laughs> for Elite Dangerous, which unfortunately Frontier doesn't share. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of lamenting it myself, but that's what I would like to see. And I don't think Elite Dangerous Odyssey is going to do that for us. But, um, so, um, you know, so, you know, so why aren't these people all immediately arrested? I mean, that's my question. I'm walking in. Um, you know, <laughs> the question was, I, where is the law enforcement? That's the other thing, you know, in, in those starports, there, there's no... <laughs> There's no security guard, okay? There should be somebody somewhere going, you know, there should be like, where's the police force? Um, you know, we, we've got authority contacts in the menu, but they, they don't exist as people. I want to go up to them and go, you know, you know all that dodgy stuff that's happening? You want to arrest those guys because <laughs> they're trying to, they, this guy tried to make me do an illegal mission. <laughs> what did he ask you to do? He, he told me to go to Leasty and murder some people. He said it wasn't, he said it wasn't strictly illegal. He's, he's trying to make me do illegal stuff. Go get him. <laughs> it's like, yeah. and then yeah, elite grass. <laughs> and then, I mean, surely that in the in the thirty fourth century, you would not stand in the middle of a concourse and go, "Hey, you unknown guy that I've never met before, I've got a dodgy mission for you." I mean, isn't there any surveillance <laughs> in the thirty fourth century? Are there any security cameras uh, that can record stuff like that? <laughs> and go, there's a dodgy mission giver, go and arrest him. You know, so um, it doesn't make any logical sense. And that's what's annoying, is there's lots of parts of the game that do make logical sense. And in the early games, the, the, the dynamics were better thought through in the sense they made logical sense. Engineers does not make sense. These mission givers in Elite Dangerous Odyssey do not make sense. But contrast that with stepping, I mean, and yeah, okay, we are, we're not going to get that Armstrong moment that we all wanted. Now, that may be technical limitations, or maybe Frontier's going to pull something out of the hat right at the last minute. You know, let's wait and see. But um, 
getting out of my ship and walking around on the surface. I miss that in Elite, in, a, in Horizons now. The fact that I've played the Alpha, and I can't play the Alpha anymore because they've switched off. Um, I miss being able to get out of my ship and just having a wander around, just being able to wander around and poke and prod things. Not that you can really do much other than shoot it and scan it, but um, you know that sense of I can walk around. There is a real sense of freedom in there. Um, and again, a lot of people will be lamenting the lack of ship interiors. And I get that because I'd like to wander around my ship. I don't care if it takes half an hour to get to the entrance bay. Um, you know, get around that by having a quick lift up to the cockpit, surely. Yeah, that's the thing. Um, and I think, and I, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm not a developer, so I don't know, but you know, the fact that we have a kind of blue circle teleport into the ship is a, is a major, major disappointment for Odyssey. Uh, and maybe it's coming, but you know, is it was it really beyond the bounds of possibility to have a stairway or a, an elevator type thing that le led you to the back of the cockpit of your ship that you could? I mean, imagine a, an, an elevator that drops down to the ground. You step into the elevator, the doors close, um, the elevator goes, bzzz, and then as the doors open, you're at the back of your cockpit, and then you walk in and get into your pilot's seat. That would have been enough for me. To go, yes, I really feel like I'm in my ship. I, you know, I understand the I, the problems with mapping the entire inside of an anaconda because it's a massive thing, you know, and the cargo bays and you know, and there is that complexity. What are you going to do in those big spaces other than just want to, you know, wander around? But the idea of being able to get into your cockpit through a mechanism that's like that lift arrangement that we have in the concourse, um, yeah, or just literally in the case of the Cobra, walk up the stairs um, to an airlock door. Um, that leads you into the cockpit. Even if you can't access the rest of the ship, they, they could have done that. They could have done that in two and a half years of development time with 100 devs, surely they could have done that. Um, because you just need to model the cockpit, okay, which is big, but it's not vast. Um, um, you know, the cockpit is a fine art area and doesn't have much in the way of moving parts. So, you know, and, and maybe it's, yeah, maybe it's too complicated and I, you know, I'm talking rubbish, but uh, that doesn't feel outrageously difficult. Um, and maybe you could do certain ships and then, you know, maybe other ships could be introduced over time. Maybe that would be something you could do. But the fact that we don't get that sense of climbing out of our ship onto the surface at this point when the ship service, you know, so we're going to get the benefit of being able to step out into planet services, but not be able to step out into the planet services, if you sort of mean, I think is a huge disappointment. A huge, huge disappointment. I think that's a major oversight. So I don't know whether that was something that just was too ambitious and they couldn't do it for whatever reason. But um, that again feels like a, la a lack of ambition, a lack of um, pushing the pushing the boundaries. Um, so it's the same story. The so Elite Dangerous Odyssey. I don't think is going to be any different from Elite. Um, dangerous and Elite Dangerous Horizons. It's the same emphasis, okay? So the graphics are going to be great, uh, assuming they get the uh, the optimization right, which I'm sure they will. That that seems to be something they can do. Um, um, the you know the sense of um, you know the audio is usually impeccable. I've never ever had had much complaint about the audio in, in Elite Dangerous. It's always been good. I think the flight models of the ships are always great, and I think that's going to continue. Um, on the surface, I think the new technology does look nice. It doesn't look great at a distance, to my mind, at the moment. At least it didn't in the Alpha. As you get close to the surface, I think it looks great. Um, but um, you know, uh, that, the the, <laughs> the genetic sample of minigame, yeah, that died a death fairly quickly. Again, I think um, there just wasn't any science. Where's the science in that? I mean. Um, Frontier surely knows that the explorers in the game are, you know, generally people who like sciencey things. So you know they want to see. You know, if I point a scanner at a rock, I want the Mr. Spock experience. You know, that rock is twenty five percent calcium. It's one percent igneous, and, and we got some of that. The thing, you know, there's some really good design decisions. You know, the SRV when it goes scanning, you know, it's got that wave scanner thing which is kind of, it takes a bit of skill to read the wave scanner. I like that. That's a really good explorey type thing because it's, you know, it, it requires some skill to read. And then when you shoot a rock, you get, you know, carbonaceous chondrites and all sorts of sciencey stuff kind of that comes back a bit. You know, you get a, a sense of, you know, I found a thing and it gets a different thing on the pulse way, on the, on the pulse scanner in the SOE. That is good exploration gameplay. Um, 
So the, yeah, the genetic sample thing wasn't, but I like the fact it was based on some real science. The the um, the blast ring thing that was that was quite interesting, but there was no science to see. Um, you know, when I point a scanner at a rock, I want I want an analysis of what the rock is made of. Um, when I you know, when we sample a plant, um, <laughs> we should sample a plant. We should get something back. Um, you know, it's a it's it's got DNA, so it's 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 that kind of thing. Or maybe it's something else. Or you know, what's what's its base component? How many chromosomes does it have? You know, what what's its um, you know, what's the cell analysis? You know, you know, is it is it anaerobic? Is it aerobic? What what does it do? What does it, what does it consume? How does it live on that planet? Um, that's the sort of stuff we're interested in finding out as explorers. And if you could do some of that analysis in your ship without having to go back home, um, you know, that that would that would make it that would make it very compelling. That would be something that would be really interesting to do. But it's very very basic gameplay. Um, scan this three times go home and it says yeah you've had a plant <laughs> great um, so I think you know the the lack of depth in some of those mechanics is just something that's just going to continue I, I, I feel um, I think the lack of law is going to continue I don't think the story is going to be um, all that notable um, I think the graphics will look great uh, as they as they always they always do but that lack of soul is 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 going to is going to continue um um do you think there will be much difference between the alpha and the game that's being released in the fortnight no i don't um i may be wrong on that one but i don't think there'll be that much difference historically um the pre-released versions of the game um that we've seen um the ones just before release um a lot of people say oh it'll just be a vertical slice and there'll be lots lots more content um they switch everything off for testing purposes and they pre-releases. Um, historically, that hasn't really proved to be the case. Um, I think it will be optimised. I think there'll be some new planetary tech. There'll certainly be some new bases. But I think the basic stuff that we've seen in the way that the dropships work, the taxis work, um, you know, the star bases and things, the interior of those, I don't think we'll see much, much difference there. I just don't think there'll be much more. Um, um, uh, so there are 18 more settlements. So yeah, okay. So that's that's good. So I think we'll we'll definitely see those. Uh, how different they will really be, um, I'm not sure. Um, so and you know, I've played the combat. I actually, I actually oddly <laughs> I prefer the combat to the exploration gameplay in Odyssey, which came as a real surprise to me. Um, and I, but I'm not a big FPS player, so I'm not really comparing it with anything else. Um, for me, again, I'll play it a couple of times. And, uh, you know, to be honest, as far as I'm concerned, I've probably played it enough already because I'm not into that sort of gameplay. And it felt very artificial. It's like, okay, well, we're in this very, very confined zone. We need to keep standing in these coloured zones that are, that start off yellow and then turn red or green, depending on who's winning. Um, and if we get enough of those coloured zones to turn the right colour, then we win. And it was like, but that, that to me isn't elite. That's, that's just an FPS. Um, it's like laser tag in space, you know, but you know, there's, there's, no, there's nothing permanent, there's nothing meaningful about it um, other than you get some credits for, for turning up. Um, again, there's no way to make a mark on the thing, you know, that's, um, we can't, you can't destroy the bases, you know, we can't damage the buildings. Uh, if we're going to capture areas of an outpost, surely it makes more sense to capture buildings. So capture the power building, secure the power building or the command building, rather than a, you know, a circular area which seems to be in the open <laughs> as a particular designated spot and outpost. It's, it just feels too gamey again to me. Um, they haven't wrestled with the problem of um, yeah, sphere of combat in the sense that, you know, ships above the... Um, I, I tried it in the end of the alpha, actually. I bought myself an Eagle, which was the smallest ship that I could mount a, a gun on. Um, and, um, and, the, and the Eagle has a nice centrally mounted um, top hard point. So I just put a beam laser, I think, in that. And I, I basically hung around... I went to a combat zone that was on the ground. I hung around above the combat zone in the Eagle with a one... Uh, a slot one beam laser and tried to um, pick off um, <laughs> NPC characters running about underneath me and there are a few interesting observations about that. One, it's virtually impossible to hit them okay but when you do hit them um, they can shrug off um, a a, um, a one you know, a slot size, you know, a small sized beam laser with no problem at all uh, which is um, kind of like, eh? 
that doesn't make any sense. Um, and oddly enough, you know, the fact that there was an eagle hanging above the drops, yeah, hanging, hanging above the combat zone, um, you know, blasting down from space uh, with a beam laser, nobody took the slightest notice of me at all. <laughs> So, so it was quite comedy, really. Is 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 there's the base, okay, and then there's my eagle sitting in space above the base and firing down from about 100 meters up with a with a beam laser, basically taking kind of Death Star like pot shots at the people on the ground. The NPCs totally ignored me. Um, the vultures come and go um, as they do. They they totally ignore you as well. There's no sense of air superiority over the um, the bases, so there is no sphere of combat between ships and what's going on on the base below at all. Now, to my mind, again, it's relatively um, simple to fix that, is that the, the bases, like the space stations, should have shields. Um, and so uh, an approaching ship can do no damage to a base because it has shields up. Um, and those shields could be extremely powerful because, you know, you can hoist a massive, massive power generator on the ground. Uh, far bigger than you can mount in the ship. So you could make bases, rather like space stations, um, totally immune to virtually any approaching starship. Uh, and the only way, and, and you know, these bases should also have very, very significant anti-aircraft defenses because, you know, it's an anarchic universe where, you know, anybody can own a massively powerful starship covered in guns, okay? So why would your ordinary outpost not be in a position to defend itself quite admirably against an incoming attack, which could just materialize out of the blue. Um, you know, so this, you know, the outpost should have shields, um, to my mind, and they should also have some fairly hefty anti-aircraft weapons, either in the form of missiles or, like the space stations do, super sod off laser beams that can obliterate anything pretty quickly. I mean, the penalty for loitering is death, right? So um, so the bases, the bases do have anti but they don't, you know, they, they don't often use them. So if I come, in, I came in with my eagle, um, and started shooting at people on the streets, I would expect to be shot down, and I wasn't. Okay, there was no response to my attack at all. So either they basically went, look at that eagle, it can't do anything. <laughs> uh, it was, it, you know, I should have been shot to pieces um, by anti-aircraft defences long before I got into range of my feeble little um, small, sort of small beam laser. But I had complete you know, ability just to keep firing. And I did manage to kill a bunch of NPCs, um, and they were way... You know, my, my beam laser um, was 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 very ineffectual against them because a partly I couldn't target them, but b even when I did hit them, it did barely any damage to the NPC commanders running around on the ground. Um, so, to my mind, the, the bases should have shields. The only way to get the shields down is to drop a bunch of us plebs in our suits, uh, and maybe we can run in. Maybe maybe shields can't stop low speed. Um, small objects, for example, so they can stop high-speed stuff like missiles, um, and obviously they stop laser beams. But maybe we, as people, can walk through the shields. In that case, then we have a situation where we need to we need to uh, we need to sneak up to the base from a distance, um, get our way through the shields, commandeer the the station, take the shields out, so we can get some air superiority in. Um, and then maybe we could take over all the you know the turrets and all sorts of things, and then we've actually taken over the base, haven't we? Um, you know, so that sort of stuff. Now, um, that's the sort of sphere of combat I would like to have seen in Odyssey, which just isn't there. Um, there's nothing for your ship to do. Uh, I even tried attacking the Apex. Um, I've, I've tried attacking the Apex shuttles. You can kill those. Uh, attacking the dropship vultures is much much harder. Okay. Um, because they effectively cheat. Uh, so I went in with an anaconda uh, with with rail guns uh, uh, and everything on them and attempted to destroy a vulture. Now I did manage to kill a vulture eventually, um, but m most of the time the vultures came in, they come in extremely fast and they are immune to um, mass locking uh, by even the anaconda. So they can, they can um, hyperspace out of dodge once they've dropped you off or dropped the NPCs off they can hyperspace out and they're not mass locked by your big ship so I managed to kill one vulture and their shields are incredibly 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 strong as well they seem to be massively OP so um, you know you can't even stop the reinforcements coming in reliably even if you've got an awful lot of firepower now that might be different in a wing um, you know if you've got Four, of, you know, maybe four big ships all taking out the vultures as they come. That might be possible. I haven't tested that, but 
certainly as an individual player with a with a decent anaconda i wasn't able to destroy very very many of the vultures before they could drop people off and you know while they're dropping people off they were sitting ducks so i literally sat above um the vulture um with, with full pips to weapons just blasting it and it's it sat there taking it and it didn't die um so you know so lots of stuff like that is kind of like it's the game is being gamey uh, rather than allowing you to influence the outcome in the way that you kind of would expect to see so and I, don't, and I don't think that's going to change. I think that's 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 my biggest criticism over, overall is that there's huge amounts of attention to detail in certain places and a total lack of attention to detail in others. Um, uh, and that that I think is just just a fixture of the game. So I don't know. Um, you know, does that <laughs> does that gel with what you guys think? Or uh, and I, I, yeah, I don't want to be negative about it because I you know I like I genuinely like flying around in spaceships. You know, this is this is this is something I really enjoy, and I'm a massive fan of elite over the years but the, the lack of attention to the law is is i think inexcusable um and some of the odd decisions in terms of the, the immersive aspects of the way npcs work and and all that stuff and you know gravity on the outposts that that's that's an appalling thing that's missing um you know it's just it's lack of attention it's lack of ambition in certain certain areas you know and we were told time and time again there's a hundred devs working on elite dangerous and they've been working on it for two years it doesn't feel as they've they've pushed as far as you might expect they could have done it 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 feels okay i think it's 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 okay um you know i will get odyssey uh, i've got i've got it on one of my accounts anyway obviously because i had the lep uh the lifetime expansion thing and i'll i will get it for the others but it will it will not be like a yeah i must get that that's that is just so awesome i've got to have it it's kind of like yeah 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 um yeah, when I've got 40 quid spare, I'll probably get that. It's, I want to be more enthusiastic than I am, and I'm just not, because I know it's not going to be as good as I hope and wish it could be. And I think it could be, with a bit more focus and direction. That's, that, 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 that's my thing. I think it, you know, I don't, and I, I haven't agreed with many of the choices that have been made. A lot of resources have been spent on things which I think have actually detracted from the game. Engineers, I would single out as the biggest detractor from the spirit of elite um overall and i think it's the one thing that's actually wrecked a lot of the game um and it's for me it's absolutely disheartening to see it's going to be continued in odyssey that we're going to have to go for a bunch of new engineers and then engineer things over and over again it's such cheap gameplay and it to my mind it doesn't have a place in elite uh, elite should be better than that i think <laughs> um so I don't know. Um, Elite Dangerous Odyssey is arguably bigger, and more resources been spent on it than the entirety of the first original Elite Dangerous game. Um, and from that perspective, it doesn't feel as ambitious as it should have been. I think so. Um, those, those, those are my sort of final thoughts on it, really. So I mean, we've come a long way. I mean, Elite Dangerous, Elite Dangerous Horizons, Elite Dangerous Odyssey is is so much bigger than any of the previous elites. I mean, it doesn't even bear any direct comparison at all in terms of its fidelity and its structure. But what it hasn't quite captured is the soul. And that's that's the bit I think that keeps eluding them. And they don't seem to to get that. And maybe they don't they don't need to care about it because, you know, the thing is being successful and it's all about making money, which at the end of the that, at the end of the day that's that's why companies exist, right? Um, but it's the passion it's the passion and the soul and the in the essence if we do that we just make it that little bit better incrementally in every little bit let's just add a little bit more care and attention to the way the npcs work let's just add a little bit more care and attention to um you know the way the missions are given out those little bit let's add a little bit more care and attention to the way that the missions are given to the star system descriptions all those little bits and pieces they add up to so much more than just the sum of their parts so um you know, little little things like that. I mean, and there's a good thing, a, a convoy. You know, why why don't we see, you know, parties of ships going about their business? Even the original elite had other traders um, flying about doing their thing, okay? We don't, there's not much sort of, um, you know, where's the traffic going from the space station to the planet and back again? Why don't we see passenger shuttles departing all the time? Uh, why don't we see big trade convoys moving around just because 
you know, they're, they're just moving around. It's not difficult to script up a bunch of anacondas with a bunch of escorts just slowly trundling around in space that you happen to bounce across. But no, everything's, it's stuff like that that's missing that just makes you feel like you're in a universe where stuff is happening even when you're not around. Um, and that, that to me is where the, the passion and the soul and the, the and I don't, I'm trying not to use the word immersion. Um, <laughs> it, but it's not there. It doesn't. It doesn't pull you into its universe and go. Oh, yeah, there's stuff happening. And you know, I was always wondering in the original Elite, the one I showed you right at the beginning. Um, you know, you know, there's a there's a spaceship coming towards me. You know, who's just materialised in front of me. And I know he's just spawned into the game because he's a piece of code. But it gave you the sense that there's another trader, and he's on a he's on a he's on a run to go somewhere. What he's doing. You know, the game just did that for you. Whereas that doesn't happen in Elite Dangerous. Because um, you get this, you know, silly repeating NPC dialogue all the time. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you're the ship I've been looking for, the one with the big hole, um, and this line is in the top percent of all. Yeah, you know, all that silly stuff you need that needs fixing, and that's that's where the attention to details missing. Um, so um, yeah, so that sort of stuff um, is is stuff that I would like to see dealt with. I would gladly trade all of CQC, all of the engineering malarkey, get, get rid of all that and put the effort into, you know, scripted missions or more complicated missions, multi-part missions and better NPC immersion and those sort of things. Um, you know, but I, I'm not, I'm not the, I'm not the producer director. So, um, so there we go. That's my, that's my 5P. Have I offered my services? Oh, they, they, they know all about me. Don't worry. <laughs> They've never asked me for that kind of stuff. I would gladly consult on it with them if they were interested. I'd probably do it for free, to be honest, um, because, you know, um, it'd be a bit churlish to ask for money for some of those sort of things. But um, the, the problem is people like me, um, I suppose are a bit of a thorn in the side now, because and, and I'm certainly not the only one. There are an awful lot of people who know an awful lot about these games. But because of all the churn that Frontier has as a business, you know, people leave and people come and go back in, um, I dare say that folks like myself and many, many others in the fan base, and many people who are probably on this chat, um, know the law and the background to Elite far better than Frontier does now. Because the, you know, the amount of churn they have and uh, in 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 you know in the devs and in the people who are producing the games and stuff you know those are jobs those are roles and they come and go over a period of a few years, whereas many of us have been fans for you know <laughs> far too long, um, and um, we know it better we know the law certainly we know the story we know all the details of the universe better, um, and when those details aren't respected or you know. You know, uh, or disappear, then then yeah, and then then we find that difficult to accept because it's kind of mucking up the universe that we kind of live in. Um, uh, did DB write or compile the law? By, well, uh, DB didn't. No, a bunch of the writers did in concert with FDev. Uh, David Braben was involved. Michael Brooks kind of spearheaded it, um, and a bunch of the writers involved um, actually constructed the law bible. Now, the, the the good thing about the law bible is it did exist. Okay, it was it was it was rough and ready, but it was there basically only some electronic documents. So you don't get an idea of this lovely leather bound tome sitting on a pedestal, you know, lit by spotlights in, in the front of FDEV. No, that, that, that didn't exist in any form like that. But it was a series of electronic documents. Okay, now I've still got those on my hard drive. Uh, I'm not allowed to reveal them because NDA. Um, but they did exist and they informed the game at the beginning and they informed the books at the beginning. Um, unfortunately, they were abandoned. Uh, like everything else that was abandoned in 2016, 2017, that, that kind of era when the great retcon happened, um, those law bibles were th simply thrown away. They just aren't referred to anymore. And I don't think that most of the people producing Elite Dangerous now, and certainly you know, the productive generations of stuff that's in Elite Dangerous Horizons, there's no reference to any of that original material at all. So the law consistency across the franchise, across the game, just isn't there. And that's noticeable in the lack of um, cohesion that you sense under the covers of, of the game. So that, that's, that's, that's where it, it doesn't work. That's where it's not so good. Um, so um, so anyway, so there we are. Anyway, my friends, it is now half past 10. I've been, I've been, my poor ship has just been flying through space in the general direction of the Tia Nizla system for like two hours while I've been chatting away. I've done absolutely nothing in the game. That wasn't really, really the intention for tonight, but it's, it's nice to kind of go back on the history. Um, we, have, we, have, we aren't any closer to Tia Nizla, surprisingly enough, at some light speed. Um, 
Oddly enough, yeah, you're quite right, Orange Side one. I don't know if that's a coincidence, but it's the same time as when the accountants got involved, so maybe that's it. Maybe it's as simple as that, is that the passion kind of went away a bit because the bean counters basically said, no, you're here to make money, um, sell more paint jobs, sell more copies of the game, um, and anything that doesn't directly benefit the bottom line, can it? it? Maybe it was as harsh as that, and I can understand that. I've worked in business, I know that's sometimes how it works. Um, but when you've got something as precious as this franchise, it's a mistake, I think, to let the passion go in favour of money. Um, I'd rather be I'd rather be happy than rich. <laughs> but not everybody agrees with that, so there we go. Um, but there we go. Um, anyway, um, 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 <laughs> that's been a vague interest. <laughs> <laughs> just waffling on for two and a half hours. Where is me? Um, I don't think the game is doomed or anything stupid like that. The game will go on to great success. Hor uh, uh, Horizons was successful. Odyssey will be a success. Um, do I recommend that you buy it straight away? No. I would I would give it a week and see what's actually in it and see how well they've optimised and see how many new bugs they've introduced uh, and what the general reaction to it is. I would I would I would hang fire on it if I were you. Um, just uh, you know, let them get a few of the problems sorted out because there will be problems, um, and um, you know that, that's inevitable. So um, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> so fingers crossed. I think it will be fun, but and I think it will improve. I mean, it's a it's a base of which, of course, they'll add new functionality too. But um, you know, give it <laughs> maybe give it the first week would be my recommendation. Anyway, my friends, I hope you've enjoyed my my. <laughs> My, my vague ramble through the universe of Elite. Um, and um, I'm back on Saturday with actually a continuing playthrough of the third game. We're actually doing that live actually on my Saturday stream. And then on, on Monday, obviously, I'm back to my, um, my my science fiction and fantasy rambles about writing, which isn't related to anything else, that, um, non, non franchise specific stuff. Um, but Elite Dangerous is what we do on Thursdays. So, anyway, my friends, as they say in the original game, write on Commanders. And obviously, as we say in Elite Dangerous, 07. So be good, have a fantastic week ahead, and uh, get yourself safely to the weekend, and I will see you there. <laughs> Take care, my friends, and see you soon.